Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking time on a Monday to come and join us. We're excited to have you here, and I think we have an agenda that is going to make good use of your time. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Couple housekeeping items. Restrooms are out the door to the hall by where you came in and on your left. When you are speaking today, please raise your hand and wait for your microphone to start working and try to speak clearly and directly into the microphone because it really helps with captioning. Very special thank you to US Telecom, Lynn and Kevin, for providing us with breakfast and lunch today. Very much appreciated. Um, any other housekeeping things? Okay. So I think we're going to start today. There are some new faces at the table, and we're happy to welcome six new appointees from the chairman's office. Um, some are here in the room. A couple are joining us by phone due to prior travel commitments. Um, and we have a couple other folks on the phone as well, so we'll be checking in with the phone periodically today. But I think the best way to start is to go around the table with some introductions. So I'm Ed Bartholomew with Call for Action. Can you hear me okay? Julie Carney with the Consumer Technology Association, starting my seventh term on the CAC and delighted to be under Ed's leadership and thank Debbie for her great leadership too. Great to be here. Thank you. I'm Steve Posiosk. I'm with the American Consumer Institute. Lynn Follinsby with US Telecom. Good morning, Jocelyn Day, Massachusetts Department of Telecommunications and Cable. Irene Leach with the Consumer Federation of America. Uh, Paul Goodman with the Center for Media Justice. Mark D. Falco with the Appalachian Regional Commission. Ross Lieberman with the American Cable Association. Larry Walk with the National Asso Association of Broadcasters. Will Reinhardt, American Action Forum. Dana Floberg with Free Press. Hi, Alex Phillips with the Wireless ISP Association. Thaddeus Johnson with Nasuka. Zainab al Kepsi with the National Association of the Deaf, representing the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Consumer Advocacy Network. Sarah Moller, American Foundation for the Blind. Kara Graves, CTIA. Debbie Berlin, representing the National Consumers League. Stephanie Cole with NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. And we have a couple people on the phone, if you could check in. Yeah, it's Barry Umansky of the Digital Policy Institute. Lick Awad, Fairfax County and Natoa, Alternate Committee. Hi, this is Louise Lachetti, representing T-Mobile, and sorry not to be there in person. Anyone else on the phone? Yes, this is Amina Fazula with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Sean Carroll, Massachusetts Department of Telecom and Cable. Last call on the phone. We had a couple people jump in while we were going around the table. Um, is it on? Olivia Wine, National Consumer Law Center. So the first speaker that we have joining us this morning is Matthew Berry, who's Chief of Staff for Chairman Pai. Uh, we did have Commissioner Clyburn scheduled, but as many of you are aware, she is currently traveling with the chairman in Florida, and they're sort of reviewing, obviously, the situation down there at, at, after the hurricanes and assessing the damage. Uh, so we have a, probably a couple minutes before Matthew shows up, so stay really close to the table, but we'll get right back into it as soon as Matthew's in the room. Thank you. <clears throat> so, 
So while we're waiting, um, I have an attendance sheet that I'll pass around and you can sort of check off or sign off that you're here. Um, also, I think we had two other people pop into the room since we did intros, so I'll um, turn the spotlight over to them for a second. Uh. Great. It's John Schwantes, Consumers Union. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And Liz Barkat with CCA. This is Mitzi Herrera, also on the phone. Hey, Mitzi, thank you. Uh, we've been asked for the um, FCC uh, Wi-Fi uh, code, and that is FCC, uh, and that's in all caps, and no space, 823302. That's FCC 823302. And while, I'm, while I have the mic, let me introduce to you my new colleague who really puts all the administrative details together for these meetings, Catherine Langston. Catherine, are you in the room, hopefully? Hi. There she is, okay. If you need anything, uh, please uh, <laughs> please let her know and she'll take care of it with, care of it with great aplomb. Yes. All right, thanks. Catherine has been a great asset in prepping for this meeting and getting out logistical stuff to everyone, so we're very appreciative of that. She actually does all the work, really.
So, as promised, we are very excited to be joined this morning by Chairman Pai's Chief of Staff, Matthew Berry. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, to the commission and welcome uh, to the new members of the committee. Uh, as you may be aware, uh, Chairman Pai and Commissioner Clyburn are in Florida today uh, assessing the impact of IRMA on the communication net networks down there and uh, seeing what lessons can be learned for future storms. So uh, they are unable uh, to be here but I'm delighted to be filling in uh, for the chairman. And uh, just wanted to discuss with you a few issues uh, that we have been pursuing um, on the uh, consumer uh, protection side of things that we think are very important. Uh, I would say that the top priority when it comes to consumer protection at the commission right now is robocalls, unlawful and unwanted robocalls, and trying to put a stop to those. And the reason that's our top consumer protection priority is because that's what the American people are telling us to focus on. It's the number one source, not one thing you can do to snap your fingers and make it go away. And so you have to pursue a number of different strategies. One strategy that we have been pursuing that I know your committee is going to is weighing in on is um, how do you how do you try to stop caller ID spoofing, which is a ma major part of this problem where the number, someone places a phone call and the caller ID makes it seems like it's from a different number. And this is what the um, robocall scammers do to try to evade detection. And it tricks people into answering the calls as well. And so one thing that we have proposed in, in, an, in an ongoing proceeding right now is to allow carriers to block calls with a caller ID is from an invalid or unassigned number, which is what the scammers often will uh, spoof their ID to appear to be from. And uh, we don't think that there's, and we have not seen yet in the record, certainly any valid reason why a legitimate caller should be spoofing their ID to come from an invalid or unassigned number. And so um, this is one proposal we're looking at, and I know I think the committee's been studying it, and we look forward to your input on it. Um, another strategy that we are looking at and we've uh, passed an NOI on is whether we can establish a call authentication system that would, re that would really authenticate that phone calls are um, valid in terms of that the caller ID is from where it, it says it is. And um, you can think of this as kind of being akin to a digital footprint uh, for uh, a digital fingerprint rather for a phone call. And um, this is something where we've gotten comments and um, are looking at this very closely. Um, and we think that this has a lot of promise for trying to cut down dramatically on unwanted robocalls. calls. And we certainly uh, appreciate uh, all, everything that industry has been doing to try to help us in terms of combating robocalls. calls. And they formed the robocall strike force last year, and a lot of good recommendations came out of that uh, report, uh, report and are being implemented. Um, but one thing that Com Chairman Pai asked at the uh, Mobile World Congress Americas last week in uh, San Francisco is it would be really great if industry engaged more deeply in an effort to try to come up with a call authentication framework because we really think that this could have enormous potential for cutting down on unlawful robocalls. Uh, a third thing that we're looking at in the robocall universe is a way to address the problems uh, problems associated with reassigned numbers. And this is a case where you change your phone number, you get rid of your old phone number, you've given permission for businesses to call that phone number, maybe your doctor's office, um, your, a furniture store you buy furniture from, and you've switched phone numbers, but the business does not know that. And so they continue to call that number. So um, the, uh, someone who doesn't want the phone calls is getting the phone calls, and you who want the phone calls is not getting, are not getting the phone calls anymore. And so we have sought comment on whether we could have a database where 
businesses could check to see if numbers have been reassigned so that people who don't want these calls are not bothered by them, and the people who do want the calls do get the calls that they want. And so that's something we're looking at. And then finally, when it comes to robocalls, enforcement and tough enforcement is very important. Um, we have proposed the largest fine in FCC history against a robocall, an alleged rob a parent robocaller who had uh, a, about 100 million robocalls over a three-month period. We've proposed a $120 million fine. Um, and these were also very misleading robocalls in terms of uh, trying to sell low-quality uh, vacation packages and saying they were associated with companies, I think like Marriott, that had nothing to do with the uh, vacation packages whatsoever. Um, and then we proposed a, a, a fine uh, in the neighborhood of $80 million against a, another individual who was engaged in unlawful robocalls and would, would joke about how what he was doing was unlawful, allegedly, and said he was, but he said it was akin to um, a, uh, by going over the speed limit. Uh, we certainly don't agree with that characterization of the seriousness of the offense. So we're doing a wide variety of things to um, crack down on robocalls, and we certainly welcome your input on these because this is a very important uh, consumer protection priority, I think, for everyone. Um, I don't want to prattle on about everything that we're doing, but I also do want to touch on a couple of other issues uh, when it comes to the consumer protection agenda that we think are very important. The first is cracking down on cramming and slamming. Uh, cramming is when you have uh, charges placed on your uh, phone bill that you've not authorized. And slamming is when your service provider is switched without your permission. And um, we have proposed rules to deal with both cramming and slamming. Um, part of it is codifying kind of unwritten rules that are out there to try to make sure that they're le more legally sound. And also, we've proposed rules in terms of how you switch services to make it harder for slammers to be able to switch your service without your permission. So we think that these are very important uh, initiatives, and we look forward to bringing them to fruition. Uh, a final thing that I would point out that we are working on, and I think you're going to hear about this today, is rural call completion. Um, we think um, you know, it has been a problem for years that you are less likely to be able to complete a call if you are calling rural America as opposed to urban America. Uh, the prior commission put in place rules um, to combat this problem. Um, I, we, they, and now we are taking a fresh look at this. Um, we think that there are improvements that could be made to the rules that would be more effective in terms of trying to crack down on the practices that result in less roll call completion. We're also taking a look to see whether some of the data collection that we're doing is actually helpful in terms of combating roll call completion uh, problems and whether or not there's a way to be more effective with our rules and have um, uh, uh, perhaps some unnecessary burdens taken away. So um, these are just three issues that we're working on. Uh, I think since you've last met, there have been action taken on other issues, such as on disability rights issues. I believe since we la you last met, we've increased the uh, requirement for the amount of video described programming that the top uh, broadcast and cable networks have to, perform, have to air. I think that will be taking effect at some point next year. Um, so there's a lot going on here. Uh, welcome uh, to the commission, and uh, I hope you have a very productive and successful meeting today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we're very happy to be joined by the Acting Bureau Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Patrick Weber. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see your, your faces again. Uh, welcome back to the commission. Um, I was here for the May meeting. It was right after I came back to the commission um, in April. So it's good to, um, to see everyone again. Thank you again for your time um, and your commitment to serve on the committee and for your expertise. Uh, we certainly appreciate everything that you contribute uh, to the commission and, and your recommendations to us. Um, I also wanted to welcome the six new members of the commission. Um, many of you have served on the, uh, I'm sorry, on the committee. Many of you have served on the committee in the past, and um, we welcome you back. Uh, Chairman Pai made that, um, that announcement on September 1st. 
Um, a few weeks ago, Ed and I sat down with a couple other uh, members of our staff uh, here in CGB, and we had a pretty productive meeting. We talked about um, the agenda um, that's, that, that you're going to be looking at today um, and kind of, you know, the recent recommendation that you had on our robocalls um, back in May and, uh, and the steps that we've taken to, to Im- implement that recommendation. Um, you're going to be hearing a little bit later this morning from uh, CGB staff about the steps that we've taken um, so far, and I think we've, we've uh, made some good progress in that regard. Um, Ed and I also spoke um, it just in general about the agenda for the, the CAC and kind of how we can make it more productive. Um, we're asking our, our speakers who come make presentations to you to uh, give you a little more context about the issue, um, kind of how we got to the point where we are now, um, what we're kind of looking uh, for as far as uh, the problems we're trying to solve, for instance, if we have an NPRM, um, just to give you some background history, hopefully give you some more color to the, the issue before you, and then hopefully that will give you, um, you know, more kind of um, ammunition to use, you know, as, as you make your recommendation. So as Matthew mentioned, you'll, you'll be hearing a bunch of things today. Uh, slamming and cramming are, are both important issues. Uh, more about how to combat robocalls. We're all, all hands on deck on that issue, robocalls. Um, I hear about it myself uh, when I tell people I'm a, I work at the FCC. They say, well, why haven't you fixed that robocall problem? Um, and I always say, we're working on it. We are. We are working on it. So um, thank you again for your contributions there. It, it truly is a team effort. Um, roll call, call completion is another issue you'll be hearing about. Um, and then outreach and education concerning the broadcast repack and, broad, and also broadband-enabled healthcare technologies. Um, they're all very timely uh, for your recommendations. So with that, um, I want to go ahead and turn it over to some senior staff at the uh, at CGB who will give you a little more details about what you'll be hearing about today. Thank you. It's nice to yeah. just seamlessly <laughs> one person to another. There you go. <laughs> the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> Good morning. Nice to see all of you here. I want to give you a short overview of what CGB has been doing in my area since you all just just met last last time you met. Um, You've heard a lot already about robocalls, and I'm going to continue that that mantra. We continue to uh, pursue our work to stop unwanted robocalls. In July, the commission launched an inquiry into a longstanding robocalls issue that involves reassigned telephone numbers. In a nutshell, the problem occurs when a consumer consents to robocalls at their current phone number, as Matthew mentioned, then gives that number up. When it's later reassigned to another consumer without the robocaller's knowledge, the new consumer may get unwanted robocalls, and the old consumer may then miss robocalls that they want to receive. So recognizing broad support for a solution to the problem, the commission asked in its NOI whether it should encourage or establish comprehensive databases that robocallers can check to see if a number has been reassigned before they make their call. The commission asked, among other things, which providers should contribute reassignment information to such a database, whether that database should be managed by the FCC or whether commercial databases, some of which already exist, are the best vehicle. The Commission also sought comment on details about the database, including how often it should be updated. Um, So moving away from robocalls, the Commission proposed new rules to tackle two more longstanding consumer issues, slamming and cramming. In July, the Commission proposed rules that would prohibit carriers from misrepresenting themselves when telemarketing to consumers and placing unauthorized charges on consumer bills. Specifically, the Commission asked whether it should require that carriers check directly with consumers before switching an account to another carrier, rather than relying on the second carrier's request for the change. The Commission asked whether it should prevent third-party charges from being added to consumers' phone bills unless the consumer expressly agrees to those charges. The Commission proposed these rules after noting that some of the bad actors who perpetrate slamming and cramming have been known to represent who they are or even fabricate a consumer's verification of a switch without actually contacting the consumer. Others ask consumers to answer questions on an unrelated call and then splice the consumer's answers into the alleged verification. Kim Wild from our Bureau will be telling you more about that proceeding later. In turning to public safety, in June the Commission proposed rules to help unmask anonymous callers who threaten and harass schools, religious institutions, and other victims. 
Specifically, the commission proposed to amend its rules to ensure that law enforcement and threatened parties can quickly identify threatening callers without the regulatory delay of applying for and being granted a waiver of the rules. The proposal lays out a path that protects consumer privacy by ensuring that caller information can only be disclosed for truly threatening calls and that only law enforcement personnel and others responsible for the safety and security of the threatened party have access to otherwise protected caller ID information. So as you can see, it's been a busy couple months for us. Uh, we're really glad that you all are on board to help us to tackle robocalls and other core consumer protection issues. Thank you all very much. Next, we're going to be joined by a, a familiar face to many of you at the table, Roger Goldblatt. And okay. I was told Roger was going to introduce yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll explain. No. Hi. Uh, I think I know most of you because I've been here since 2000. I think uh, some of you guys have also. <laughs> you know, Scott and I started the same day, actually. Uh, anyway, uh, I... I, I now oversee both the Consumer Outreach Division and what's called WPPD, which is Web Publishing and Print Division. And we're going to have a presentation by them because it's kind of important because that that's where we have a consumer page on the web. We have um, all, all of our consumer publications are done by them. And we'd love input, and they'll, they'll talk. But I wanted, this is Becky Lockhart from our Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division, to, get, to come back to see you. I had to memorize all of these, uh, these things. Uh, CAOD. And we, we have an event coming up next month, and she's going to tell you about it really quickly. <laughs> she didn't know it was really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so we have a, a, an event coming up on October 23rd, which is called the Accessibility Innovation Expo. It's going to be downtown at the Pepco Edison Gallery, um, which is located at 702 8th Street um, Northwest. It's near um, Gallery Place in Chinatown, so it's a very accessible location for people traveling, whether you're coming on the metro, and it's easy to walk inside. It's just on the uh, first level. Um, it's a free event open to anyone, so we encourage you to share this information and attend yourselves. Um, it's basically a showcase of technologies um, that help aid accessibility, and there's also um, our Connect to Health team here at the FCC helped us gather some exhibitors as well. So there's going to be broadband-enabled broadband health technologies there, so it's really going to be a cool interactive event um, just showcasing how technology has really impacted the way um, our, our <coughs> lives, especially for those with disabilities, and all of us connecting to the um, health atmosphere. So we encourage you to attend. Um, there's going to be around 25 to 30 exhibitors. We're still narrowing them down. Um, and like I said, it's October 23rd from 10 a.m. to 12. And we'll have some flyers here today that you guys can grab. And please spread the word. And thanks. Thank you, Becky. Okay. All right. We kind of need the chair, so. <laughs> Thank you. She, she's great. Anyway, okay. So now Howard Parnell, who runs P WPBD, and Mike Snyder, who's the deputy, who also happens to be our CGV press person, uh, is going to come and give the presentation. I'm just going to sit here. Is this good right here? Folks, hear me? So, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Howard Parnell. I am the chief of the Web and Print Publishing Division. Uh, it's a division that's focused on consumer education uh, and producing a variety of materials ranging from consumer guides to infographics to posters to uh, flyers and uh, web pages and, and the like. Uh, we were formed in 2011, uh, and uh, we've been at it ever since. We've got a small but uh, pretty solid group of editors, designers, uh, and web producers. Uh, it's uh, the team is led day to day by Mike and myself, um, 
And we, uh, the core of what we do is a library of 160 consumer guides uh, with topics ranging from robocalls to scams to phone service to uh, accessibility. Uh, we track the metrics very uh, frequently. Uh, we Some of these guides get in the tens of thousands of page views on a regular basis. So we are reaching folks with, uh, with these educational materials. Uh, we also provide uh, these guides in multiple languages, including Spanish and four Asian American languages, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and Tagalog. Uh, that's fairly recent, uh, but we're rolling that out now across the site. Uh, but I guess yeah, we, and we also provide some web content and design services to other parts of the commission on request. But really, uh, the core of what we do is uh, is addressed by you folks and, and sort of defined by you folks. And we make our editorial choices based in large part uh, of what you guys are talking about and the issues you're grappling with. So uh, we're happy to be here. Happy to introduce ourselves. Mike, do you have anything to add? Um, I'm Mike Snyder, and, and as Howard mentioned, and Roger, I'm I'm uh, deputy chief of, of this division. I would just say that um, if uh, that 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 the page that we most work on the for uh, it, if you go to the front of the FCC's website, there's a tab that says for consumers, and if you click on that, it brings you into the consumer help center, um, and and that page is where you'll see most of our work featured. Uh, we try to keep topical at the very top of that page right now. You would see emergency communications tips because of the disasters uh, or, or uh, emergencies associated with the nat national disasters, I'm sorry, natural disasters, um, associated with the hurricanes uh, through the Caribbean and the uh, and Gulf of Mexico. Um, and, and you'll also see our go-to kind of uh, consumer guides there. That's where you'll see guides about robocalls, many of which have been informed by the recommendations of this committee. Um, very recently, we made a change to that guide based on your most recent recommendations. Um, and you can also find this through our site search. You can find it through a web search. Uh, all roads should lead to the For Consumers page, in our opinion. Um, and, and we invite you there to, to take a look at that page and, and click through some of the materials that are on it. You'll notice there that that's where we're featuring our, our translated materials as well. So um, all our consumer library is available through that page. Okay. okay. I just want to add one of the new projects we want to add to our publications are blogs, uh, consumer blogs. And we found through experience and talking to other agencies that personal stories sell a lot. Uh, people can relate better if we tell us, you know, don't, you know, do this if you get a complaint or, if, you know, you, you get spoofed. But if we tell Mr. or Ms. So-and-so from this city had this call, this is what happened, this is what they did. So I was talking to Ed and Scott one day, and, and we thought it might be a great idea since CAC members really have a wealth of resources that if you come across any great examples of somebody who's been affected by an FCC action, uh, if you can, with their permission, obviously, pass along the story, and uh, we, 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 could, we could use it as, as, as one of our consumer blogs, uh, it, it really sells so much better. The other point is Mike and Howard's office do all our consumer advisories. So sometimes you might hear of something that might be a potential subject before it even hits us. So even if you're not sure, go through Scott or Ed or whoever, whatever the procedure is, and hopefully it'll get to us. Yeah, good. Uh, and uh, because that'll help us quite a bit. Uh, like I say, I've, I've been here for almost 20 years, and CAC and its predecessor, uh, CDTAC, uh, has always been a great help for us when we're trying to get the word out. Uh, so if you can help us also with, with these foreign languages, especially the Asian uh, languages, if you can help us get it out to the right communities, 
we'd really appreciate that. Uh, you can have the best product, but if nobody knows about it, it isn't so great. So thank you very much for your hospitality, for having us here, and it's good to see you all. And just quickly, um, a couple of the things that you're discussing have been things that the CAC has recommended over the years, so it's great to see those in motion and in place. We'll make sure that Ken McEldowney knows about the right. Asian that's language right. content because that's, <laughs> that's always on his radar. Um, and I, I will quickly also plug the tweets that you guys send out, um, and that's been increasing in prominence, and it ties to consumer content and information and tips for avoiding robocall scams and things like that. It's great to see that out there, and I, I hope that we can all help um, spread that message for you. So we look forward to doing that. Thanks. Thank you. I think Just questions? Yes. My mic on? Yes, it is. Well, first of all, Roger, great to have you back before us, uh, and thank you for everything you do with, with outreach. It's so important to consumers. And um, I just wanted to know, and particularly with, with the other folks who are here, if you uh, keep track of how many consumers actually go online to request information, how much your response you're getting in terms of the materials that you produce. So uh, we regularly track analytics for consumer pages on, the, uh, on our website. Uh, and I don't have a full report with me now, but you know, I did mention uh, robocalls is right up there in the top two or three. Uh, and again, these are in a given week, maybe in a given two weeks. We're talking tens of thousands of page views for some of these top guides. Uh, in addition to robocalls, we've got uh, telephone scams, we've got uh, accessibility, we've got some broadband guides out there. There's, a, there's 160 of these guides. Uh, that's the core group, and um, you know we're just we're just looking for ways to to get more and more eyeballs on them. But uh, we've been pretty happy with the way things are going, particularly with uh, the top ten or twenty, and how they sort of dovetail with this group's priorities and the commission's priorities. And, and as you mentioned, the social media posts earlier, I've I the social media is managed through our office of media relations, and we feed them. Uh, tweets related to the consumer issues, and they're they're very helpful in pushing those out, and they track those as well. And we're told by that office that that the please give us more that the consumer posts that they push out are the ones that do the best in terms of traffic and eyeballs and clicks and retweets and mm -hmm. et cetera. Right, and those those <laughs> you know, and the circles close when. You're on social media, you see a tweet, you click through, you find yourself on our website with our guides. Then, you know, we have related guides available, and uh, people hopefully are taking deep dives into the information. Steve? Oh, sorry, Olivia and then Steve. Hi. While you were talking, I, I went and I checked out from my phone the, the website, and I, I did switch over to the, the FCC.gov video, the what YouTube videos you're showing as well. Like if you send out a tweet, if you could, you know, when you do the events, for example, like the one that's coming up um, at the Pepco office um, where there's new technologies, if there is a way to capture like a, this is how you use this technology or, or check this out, you know, in a little sort of bite-sized nugget, but, you know, things like how you, how you brick your phone or, you know, little how-to uh, videos like that might be helpful. I mean, just to experiment with it to see if you can link that to a tweet and see if the clicks go up. Um, because I think for lower literacy populations, like seeing and watching uh -huh. um, could be another way to actually get the information across as opposed to relying so much on text. I think that's a great idea. And, and we, we are equipped to do that. And, uh, and Mike, in fact, is, is a videographer in his spare time. So uh, we, we, should, we should explore that idea and, and, and play around with it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, hi, this is Steve. I'm with uh, the American Consumer Institute. Um, yeah. Just sure. looking out ahead, uh, we have uh, broadcast repacking, um, and I think there's a big need for uh, education on that front because um, we're talking about a whole lot of changes and where they would take place, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when they would take place, uh, what stations are changing. Um, as well as uh, how consumers need to rescan their TV and that those sorts of right. things. 
Uh, so just a heads up, I think there, there needs to be a, a, a multi-pronged strategy to kind of get that um, uh, education out there, and I can see your organization being part of that. Uh, yeah. I'll let Mike speak to this too, but uh, we are, we've been working sort of hand in glove with the incentive auctions team for months now. We, we actually have a rescanning video out there, and we're mm-hmm. looking at you know, what else we can do. Uh, uh, we're tying in related guides to that, to that effort as well, but uh, we're, you know, we're gearing up for that. But thank you for the heads up, Mike. Yeah, I would I would just say yeah, absolutely. We're and we're we're in very close contact, working closely with the incentive auctions task force team, do on the post auction uh, consumer education, and they're uh, it's it's huge in terms of what's going to happen, and they're tracking it very closely, and they're going to be feeding us the information we need, and we're going to be pushing it out as as uh, as best we can. And, with that in mind. And I just say getting the timing right is essential for that because it's yeah. such a fluid thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like it's all happening overnight. I mean, thank God, but, but getting the timing right is, uh, is key. Yeah. And I think by, by maybe your next meeting, if it's okay, we'll have our outreach team talk about our incentive auction yeah. outreach plan. Uh, we're, we're putting the finishing touches on it now. So uh, we'll be happy to share that with you. Thanks. We love agenda volunteers, so that's perfect. (laughs) Does anybody on? Oh, sorry, Irene. I'm Irene Leach with the Consumer Federation of America, and I'm wondering if there are any guidelines or suggestions that you all have for consumers who are having challenges with repairs when equipment doesn't work. Um, I've had some challenges this summer with both wireless and uh, landline uh, within my family. And um, it it seems that uh, expecting people to do without service for several weeks is becoming pretty typical. And uh, I'm just concerned, particularly for health and safety uh, reasons, uh, about that occurring. Well, I mean, it is a health and safety issue. That's that's for sure. Mike, did you have? Uh, uh, on? Yeah, I, I I appreciate that, and I think that's something we would take back and and do a little more. See what we could do in in, in terms of uh, focusing on that specific issue. I don't. Nothing is springing to mind in in our current inventory that's yeah. that is directly related to that. Um, but but we can take that on, and that's the kind of suggestion that, that we're glad to take from you. If, for example, uh, my mother's landline went out, and uh, she li- she's in her 80s and lives alone, and really counts on you know that. And she felt she had no, we were not around, and she felt she had no option when they told her it was going to be 12 days before they could get there. And that Excuse she would me, all we end. can't hear anything. Apparently, the phone people can't hear us. So, but anyway, um, and 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 she, um, you know, didn't um, Hello? feel like she and she didn't. I came back and got. I can't call, do anything either. It still took quite a while. So yeah, we just lost it. Yeah, the telephone volume was low from the very start. I could hear it really on the line. But not from the commission meeting room very well at all. Well, right. I'll send an email right now. It's sent us to Scott Dash Marshall at FCC.gov and should be able to talk to somebody. We can hear them talking about it. So they're coming back. Did she get her service back? Did we get our service back? After, <laughs> after about 12, uh, 12 days. Wow. Oh That's a long time. Mm. Got Jocelyn. Hi. You had mentioned um, languages in Spanish and four Asian languages. Are you considering uh, communications in other languages as well? Uh, I mean, we're certainly not ruling that out. Uh, the uh, the Asian American languages are the most recent addition, uh, and we went with 
uh, what we uh, what you know, research suggested that the four we the four we selected were the top ones to to go after, uh, and then we can look beyond that. Is there a specific language you had in mind? Yeah, I'm sure it may be um, indicative of the other states as well, but we have a Haitian population, Haitian Creole, um, Russian languages. Uh, Portuguese is another language that is prominent that we hear from consumers. Well, we'll, we'll take a look at that. I'm going to check in with the phone if you can hear us. Does anybody have any questions? I can hear you speaking faintly, but I couldn't hear any of the previous discussion. Apologies. Hopefully that's been resolved. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we hope to see you all at PEPCO in October. And, Taking attendance. And on that, Scott did send around information about that expo, and we will make sure that we resend that to everyone uh, following the meeting. Okay. So next up, we're very happy to be joined by Suzanne Singleton, who's chief of the Disability Rights Office for CGB. And Suzanne's going to join us from the center of the table over there. OK. Uh, we have a microphone for our interpreters, so uh, I communicate in sign language. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to bring you up to speed uh, as to what's been going on with our office since the middle of May. Uh, I understand that Karen Pelt Strauss usually comes here and provides us updates. She's unable to do so today, uh, so I will be doing that in her stead. As you've heard already um, from Matthew Berry, we have uh, already passed video description rules on July 12th, 2017, and those rules will be effective July of 2018. And basically, video description uh, is a service that allows people who are blind or visually impaired to access video programming by supplementing the on-screen activity with auditory description of that activity to provide a more complete entertainment experience for those people. With these new rules, we have increased the hourly requirement from from 50 hours to 87.5 hours, which is an increase of 75%. And currently, the broadcasting networks that are covered are ABC, CBS, Fox, NBC, and non-broadcast networks are the Disney Channel, the History Channel, TBS, TNT, and USA. Uh, this list will be updated next year to reflect the ratings that are determined by Nielsen ratings. Uh, and those will be done on July 1st of 2018. So that is one of our recent developments. We also, over this past summer, have two new areas uh, in which we now have rules that are in effect. The first has to do with internet delivery of video clips. And since July 1st of 2017, the live and what's called near live video clips on the internet are now required to be captioned if they have previously been shown on television. Uh, this is an obligation that stems from the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, or CVAA, and uh, those IP video clip rules were adopted in July of 2014, and now we finally see this effective as of July 1st of this year for, again, as I said, live and near live video clips. You may hear uh, some of your constituents or consumers uh, concerned that things like news programming, when shorter clips are subsequently shown on the internet, they're not captioned. However, this is a new uh, requirement that's in effect. The rules have been on the books, but the video clips for live and near live programming have not been effective until relatively recently when shown on the internet after the program has been shown on specifically on the video program distributors own website as opposed to third-party websites those video clips rules do not extend as I said to those third-party websites or third-party apps those are only for full-length video programs that are first shown on television and subsequently on the internet. In those cases, it does not matter which provider is showing it, but if it is full length, it must be shown uh, with captioning. 
those who are in effect of July 10th of 2018. There is also a new requirement for multi-channel video program distributors, uh, that we call MVPDs, must pass through audible emergency information through the secondary audio stream on second screen devices, uh, like tablets, smartphones, laptops, etc. The purpose of that rule is to ensure that emergency information is made accessible for those who need it uh, in an audio format. For example, uh, the text crawls that are visual information on screen needs to also be made accessible via audio. People who are looking for information about hurricanes, wildfires, other natural disasters, or other emergencies. If that information is being displayed visually, then it must also be provided via audio methods on these second screen devices. That requirement only applies if that information is delivered to the subscriber who is watching the MVPD's provider's scheduled programming over the MVPD's network as part of the MVPD's service. So it's very limited in terms of scope. Now moving on to some other things that we have been doing uh, since your last meeting in May. With regards to video relay service and telecommunications relay service, VRS and TRS, we have released an order to establish the new four-year rates for those services. These are the compensation rates for the providers of those services. We've also released a public notice at the end of July to announce to state programs to file their applications to renew their certification by the end of October. Uh, those certifications are renewed every five years. Moving on to emergency uh, information, the activities we've undertaken. Um, of course, it's very timely given the recent natural disasters in the nation. We had a 911 outages workshop that was hosted on September 13th and is now archived online. Uh, it is really important for consumers, as we've talked in very great depth at that uh, workshop, about how to make sure that notifications to consumers about outages are accessible and effective, how to reach individuals, not just people with disabilities, but people who are living in rural areas, uh, to ensure that these notifications are effective. And we had uh, many individuals attend, organizations who are represented there to talk about best practices, uh, including representatives from Facebook, uh, representatives from consumer organizations, and so forth. And that is archived online. Uh, another emergency-related activity uh, has to do with emergence, the Emergency Alerting System, or EAS. As you know, last year we had a test of the Emergency Alerting System. Uh, it was September of 2016. We are undertaking another test coming up in September 27th of 2017 at 2.20 p.m. to evaluate the effectiveness of this test. It's going to be broadcast through uh, radio broadcasting stations, television broadcast stations, um, cable stations, wireline uh, video systems, and satellite service providers, uh, and digital audio uh, providers, digital radio. Um, and there is a message that will clearly indicate that this is simply a test, and we welcome any of your input about whether or not this test is accessible. Uh, if there are any concerns about how the test is conducted, please reach out to us. We have an online filing system to receive input about the EAS test that is coming up, uh, and that is being run by our Public Safety Bureau. Uh, the FCC's Public Safety Support Center is what to look for online, and we welcome your feedback there. Uh, moving on to another upcoming event. Uh, on October 16th, we will be having the Disability Advisory Committee, the DAC, uh, meeting here. And as I understand, a number of you are going to be there as well at that committee. We appreciate all of your hard work and participation in that committee to make recommendations to the commission about issues that you feel are important to you. Uh, the agenda will be released this coming week, uh, and uh, what we will be addressing at that meeting will be outlined there. There are four subcommittees under the DAC that often bring their recommendations to the floor for a vote, similar to the way that the CAC operates here, I'm sure. 
Uh, the theme for this next month will likely have to do with the National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Um, I'm sure you've heard from WPPD and CAOD that we are also going to be doing a number of events over the course of the month to observe what is called NDEAM, the National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Last but not least, we also do have the access info at FCC.gov account. That uh, is a place to subscribe to all manner of accessibility information. So if you're not subscribers and would like to be, please make sure you send an email to, again, access info at FCC.gov. Uh, thank you, and I am happy to answer any questions. Great. Do we have any questions? Anyone on the phone with questions? <coughs> Anyone with questions for Mark or Patrick since we skipped that part? <laughs> 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 All right, great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> so we are scheduled for a break now, and our next speaker is at 1035. Um, so that's a little bit longer than we had planned for a break. So hopefully if she arrives a little early, let's maybe be back and ready to go a little early so we have some good time to devote to that next presentation. So try to be back in the room by 1030. Thank you. Everybody could sort of settle back in. So up next, we're very excited to be joined by Dewana Terry, who is Acting Deputy Bureau Chief here at CGB. Um, many of you over the years have requested that we have a better opportunity to get more feedback on the recommendations that we make. Um, and as you know, in May, we passed a robocall recommendation that teed up, I think it was about nine action items or suggested action items for the commission to pursue. And Dewan is here to share with us sort of what's been done and what they're working towards and all the other good stuff. So this is very exciting for us, Dewan. Good morning. Um, before I started, I wanted to, um, I oversee the Consumer <coughs> Inquiries and Complaints Division within the Bureau, and I wanted to go back to a comment that was raised, I think, during the outreach update portion, and from what I recall, it was someone who was without service um, for 12 days and was trying to figure out if there's any kind of way to expedite. And I I overheard it, and I just wanted to reach out to say this. I do not know, and I did not hear in the context of that exchange, whether a informal complaint was filed or not. So I'm, I'm, for those on the phone, I'm getting a nod that an informal complaint was filed. And what I would say in those situations where there are time sensitivities, I mean, we have a process where um, which now has become very expeditious in terms of serving complaints on providers, but they still have up until 30 days to respond back. So if there's a time sensitivity associated with the complaint, such as um, I'm without service um, for an extended period of time, I encourage you to follow up with us, um, consumers to follow up with us. Others do that when it's a time sensitivity and they hear that I'm going to be without my um, phone service for um, days and I can't um, deal with that for various reasons. Not saying that we can always make it come to fruition, but we can at least do something expedited to follow up with the provider to make sure that um, they are aware of the time sensitivity and that they can respond accordingly. So I'm not guaranteeing success on that, but I'm just making sure that everyone is aware that that's a way to follow up and help us to ensure that the consumer gets a response, um, particularly in those situations where there are time sensitivities. So you can call the um, 1888 call FCC 
or you can contact myself um, and we will try to um, expedite that. And I put that out there, but again, that's regarding time sensitive <laughs> kind of scenarios, whether it's a time sensitive scenario or a health concern or just something where someone is at risk because they don't have service and we will try to expedite that as best we can. So moving on to why I'm here. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity um, to speak with you this morning regarding some of the work the Bureau is doing on the FCC's informal complaint process. Before starting, I wanted to echo the sentiment that has been expressed by others who have spoken before me. We are very appreciative of the input that we have received from the CAC. Over the past several years, in connection with the most recent consumer complaint reform initiative, which began about three years ago, and even before then. Not only do we welcome and value the input received from the CAC, we also consider it a significant part of our process. With that being said, we look forward to continuing the partnership that we've enjoyed over the years as we work towards the mutual goal of ensuring that the FCC's informal consumer complaint process is one that is user-friendly and effective for consumers. So, let me now provide the report back to you regarding your recommendations of May 2017. I'm not promising that I'm going in order, but I'm going to try to cover everything. Um, one recommendation was that we simplify the consumer complaint filing process for unwanted calls, specifically seeking development of a form that allows for information to be entered about multiple unwanted calls at once. We agree that this would be a good addition and would be a win for the consumer in terms of user experience as well as increased ease in filing complaints. We are currently exploring what would be entailed to bring this to fruition. We will keep you apprised of our progress on this front. Um, this will include coordinating with our colleagues within the FCC, as well as looking at what changes would need to be uh, made in connection with our system um, that actually um, is the intake for informal complaints. A second recommendation was that we create a separate intake portal for unwanted call complaints. In the recommendation, it was envisioned that this portal would have a unique complaint center landing page position. In response to this request, in July 2017, we added a file an unwanted call complaint button on the landing page for the consumer complaint center. As we get feedback and additional experience with whether or not this is making a difference, we will look towards whether further action is necessary. So hopefully you all have um, seen the addition of this button. If not, I would encourage you to look at the landing page. And I would also encourage you to not only try it out yourselves, but also encourage your constituents to try it out so we can get some feedback in terms of whether this is making a difference, um, should we be looking at doing something further. There was an ask that we explore making complaint data available to third parties on a near real-time basis in order to maximize its usefulness for companies whose robocall analytics engines use the data to identify telephone numbers that may be candidates for blocking or providing alerts to consumers. Um, we looked at this um, request in the context of what we currently do. Um, currently, we uh, release data on a daily basis. And given our, um, I'll say, initial informal um, fact-finding mission about those who um, utilize the data, it seems that the current um, daily release is working for them. Um, I would encourage you to 
let us know if that changes, but that has been our experience uh, right now. That's the information and intel that we have. So at this point, we are going to continue to use sort of the daily release of information with uh, monitoring and wait and see if it would be helpful to do um, some other time frame in terms of release of the data. But we are appreciative for that um, recommendation because it's always good to check on things that you think are going well to make sure that they're still working. Just checking my notes here. Uh, oh. There was a recommendation that we incorporate educational information into the response sent by the FCC to consumers who submit an unwanted call complaint. And one of the suggestions was that this could be a link to the FCC's enhanced consumer guide um, about unwanted call complaints. And um, the response should also explain how unwanted call complaint data is used. Um, again, I'm happy to report that on August 8th, uh, we uh, revamped our response to consumers filing um, unwanted call complaints. That response included the uh, requested link to the consumer guide. It also gave um, some additional information in terms of how um, I want to call complaint data is used. Um, for those of us uh, who prefer plain language, we also use the opportunity to make the response uh, more consumer friendly, um, more um, easy to understand. And so again, we would like um, your input and um, feedback in terms of whether um, this is making a difference, um, whether there are some additional tweaks we should make in that regard. But um, we're thankful for the opportunity to be able to report back that we consider this one as another check for the um, benefits of our ongoing partnership. There was also a recommendation that we develop an app that can be used by consumers with mobile devices to quickly file complaints for unwanted calls received on their device. The app should be accessible to and usable by people with disabilities and that the app would automate the entry of actionable information as well as additional details if available. Um, for that one, um, it's going to be similar. My response is similar to um, the one where we were talking about the uh, multiple calls, uh, being able to file a complaint regarding uh, multiple calls. This one is one that we're exploring um, in terms of um, how to best proceed. Um, the one thing that I can say right now um, with respect to our progress on this one is that we think that um, this is an interesting um, initiative um, that will take some time to figure out. Um, we also um, are looking forward to what would be the most effective um, and expeditious strategic partnerships to get us to the point where we can um, truly assess how to implement and um, whether to implement this particular recommendation as you all have presented it. So please stay tuned. Um, we'll be probably reaching out to you as we continue to um, forward our thoughts regarding this particular um, recommendation. So I think the final one, and I know someone's got a checklist that's keeping me honest. I think the final one that I have is with respect to the recommendation that we build upon the existing memorandum of understanding with the FTC by exploring the value and feasibility of creating a co-hosted single education and complaint portal 
for the issue. Um, on this one, I can say that we uh, routinely assess um, how we can um, leverage um, our collaborative work with other um, with our federal partners. And so um, this is something that's in the queue along that line as well. So I don't have any specific implementation um, progress to report on that one other than that is in the queue to be discussed. So I think I've covered all of the recommendations. That was my intent. Um, so I'll take questions, comments. So before we go into questions, I just want to quickly add that you also were able to update and make some changes to the education resources guide, and that happened very quickly after we passed the recommendation, and that was exciting to see. Um, I believe they're also available in some other languages, which is something else we pointed out. And there have been some exciting announcements about enforcement actions that have taken place, and that was also something that we requested in the recommendation. So just a lot of effort, I know, has gone into this, and we're very appreciative of you guys taking our recommendation to heart and implementing it and taking action on a number of items so quickly. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, any questions? Irene? Not really a question, but a thank you, uh, because this is something we've been asking for for a long time. So very much appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? Anyone on the phone? Uh, Rick Elwhite here, Fairfax County. I was looking on the site to see if I could find that button for unwanted calls. Um, I'm not seeing it offhand. Where should I be looking? In the upper right, are you on the Consumer Complaint Center landing page? I think so, yes. Uh, uh, stop unwanted calls, texts, and faxes. That might be the guide. So if you go to the Consumer Complaint Center landing page, you should see in the top um, there's a section, which is a blue section. Ah, I and see it now. Good. You Thanks. see it now? Okay. Sure. Um, additionally, we have also... Many of us have been very active in working with you guys on the Consumer Complaint Center over the years, and I just wanted to put in a plug for all the great work that everyone there has done and how wonderful James Brown has been to work with um, in helping us with things um, over the years. And I, I wanted to add that another thing that we had talked to James about recently is the ability to view complaint data over time. Because um, when the graphs and the pie charts first came out, they were sort of fixed at when the complaints started. Um, but since having that conversation within the last few months, that's another tool that's been added. So for anybody who hasn't had a chance to visit recently, you can now take any of the charts or graphs and manipulate them by time period. So you can look at the past six months or the past year and see if things are going up and down over different periods of time, which I think is an incredibly valuable resource um, for all of us who are, who are coming to the commission with sort of a focus on the complaints and the and driving our interactions based on real information that the commission's seeing. So that's also helpful, and I wanted to say thank you again. And in response to that, I, I did want to point out, as I did with respect to um, the informal complaint with um, time-sensitive issues, if there are things that um, you believe that we can do to make it better, um, I would encourage people to not be um, timid about reaching out to us um, to give us the suggestions. Um, again, we can't guarantee that we will implement exactly as you envision, but just getting the feedback gives us things to look at, to think about, and it may take us a while on um, some um, topics, but it is our desire to improve the process and to make it as effective as possible. So if you have data requests, again, no guarantee, but we would like to know um, what will make it easier for you and your constituents um, for the better. Thank you again.
So next up, we have another familiar face here at the CAC. Um, we're happy to once again be joined by Kimberly Wild, who's an attorney advisor for the Consumer Policy Division with CGB. And she's here to give us an overview and an update on the July 2017 MPRM that was focused on unauthorized carrier charges and related unauthorized charges. Carrier changes, sorry, and related unauthorized charges. Good morning, everyone. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces here, but a lot of new faces as well. So um, I'm glad to be here today to talk to you guys about the MPRM that was released in July. Um, the MPRM proposes uh, and seeks comment on several ideas to try to curtail the practices of slamming and cramming, which continue to be a problem for consumers that we see through the consumer complaints. <clears throat> Um, the MPRM was voted on at the July meeting. Uh, it was released the next day. It was published in the Federal Register in August, and comments came in last Wednesday, September 13th, and reply comments are due October 13th. So we're in the midst of taking a look at those comments that came in last week um, to see what folks are saying about the request <laughs> for comments and the proposals. I'm sure you all know what it is, but slamming is the unauthorized change of a consumer's preferred carrier, and cramming is the placement of an unauthorized charge on a consumer's telephone bill. Um, both of them have been long-standing problems for the consumer. We received over 8,000 slamming and cramming complaints in the past two years, and that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. We also received over 50,000 billing complaints, and we're pretty sure that a percentage of those are cramming complaints. They're just characterized by the consumer as billing. It's also important to note that many states have their own slamming rules, so we don't see complaints from certain states, and a lot of those states are very large states, like California and Texas and New York. So what we see coming in at the commission it's a pretty good size volume, but it's nowhere near what the complaints are throughout the country for this practice. What, what we've noticed over the years with slamming and cramming is the carrier's tactics have changed. Um, when we first put our rules into effect, we were in the midst of a marketplace where people purchased services individually. And today, most people purchase bundles of services. So while we're seeing slamming complaints, we're seeing a very different type of slamming complaint. They've started to evolve. Um, what we're noticing is that the carriers are actually committing fraud. They're not just um, failing to comply with our verification rules in some slight way. They're actually, um, their business plan is fraudulent. So what we've noticed is that um, Folks are either misrepresenting who they are on the telemarketing and sales call they place to the consumer. So we're getting a lot of complaints where someone says, um, I was called by a company. They said they were my current provider. They said they were just upgrading me. But in effect, they were a totally different provider, and they slammed them. We're also seeing uh, fraud when the switch is being verified. So the rules that we have in place today are verification rules, things the carriers have to do to actually authorize a switch. Um, what we're seeing these carriers doing is they're calling consumers under a false pretext like, you have a package at the post office. Could you tell me what your address and your name is? Could you answer a question with like yes or no, then they're taking these responses for the consumers and they're splicing them into a third-party verification, submitting them to the carrier, and changing the person's service. Um, so recently there was an enforcement action that outlined that exact type of, of scam, that folks were actually hearing from companies that said they had a package or that they had a delayed delivery and they were using those answers to make a verification. So this is a very different thing than we saw in the past. Um, we're also seeing charges just dropped onto folks' bills without any, any contact with the consumer whatsoever. And a lot of these scams are targeting very vulnerable populations. Um, we have a lot of older people being targeted. We have a lot of immigrants being targeted. Um, and so what we decided is while we have rules in effect, truth and billing rules that tell you how to place charges on the bill and help you recognize if there's an unauthorized charge on your bill, 
and verification rules for the slamming process, these rules have not kept up with the bad actors that we see today. And so this notice of proposed rulemaking was to propose some changes to our rules and seek comment on some things that would hopefully curtail this new evolved type of slamming and cramming. So what does the NPRM do? Um, Basically, we propose to codify two new rules. Um, One of them is to prohibit misrepresentations on the telemarketing and sales calls that are placed to consumers, because as I noted earlier, people are um, lying about why they're calling you and what they want to do. So currently, our Enforcement Bureau uses Section 201B, which is a very broad statutory provision for us to enforce these types of things, we'd like to codify a rule against misrepresentations on the sales calls. And if there is any misrepresentation, it would render the subsequent change, authorization for a change, invalid. The second rule we'd like to codify is a cramming rule. Again, our Enforcement Bureau is using Section 201B currently to um, enforce crams. What we'd like to do is have a prohibition against unauthorized charges on the telephone bill. So those are the two rules that we're proposing. The NPRM is also seeking comment on several other proposals to try to shore up bar slamming and cramming rules. Um, We're seeking comment on whether we should make a pick freeze, a preferred carrier freeze, the default for every consumer rather than something the consumer has to initiate, which is what the the process is today. So that would mean that every consumer, when they have a preferred carrier, that carrier would be locked in or frozen in place until they lift that freeze. Um, Another thing that we are seeking comment on is whether we should allow your current carrier to re-verify with you that you actually want to change providers. Um, Currently, this type of re-verification is not allowed. So when someone calls you and you agree to change your service, they simply submit that change to your current carrier, and that current carrier has to execute that change without being allowed to verify with you. Um, Let's see. Another thing we're seeking comment on is um, blocking of certain third-party billing. We know there's been a lot of enforcement in the past few years about um, blocking certain charges on wireless bills without without opt-in from the consumer. We would like to extend that and have no third-party charges be placed on your bill without you opting into those charges so you'll be aware of what you're actually being billed for. We are also seeking comment on um, requiring carriers to record the sales calls. Uh, As I said before, one of the rules we're proposing to codify is about misrepresentations on the sales calls. So we're seeking comment on whether it makes sense to require carriers to actually record the sales calls that they place and retain those recordings for a period of time. So if there is misrepresentation on the sales call, you would have evidence of that misrepresentation. That would certainly help our enforcement folks, um, but we're, we're asking for people to provide us input and cost-benefit analysis on that. Uh, And finally, we are seeking comment on third-party verifications. TPVs are one of the most commonly used methods of um, authorizing, verifying the authorization of a carrier change. So what that means is if someone calls you and they talk to you about switching providers and you say yes, they then tell you, okay, I'm going to transfer you over to a third-party verifier, and they're going to verify that you actually want to make this change. And then they will forward you to another person who will verify, ask you a certain amount of questions that you want to make the change. Um, As we've discussed earlier, these can be fabricated, and we're seeing a lot of fraud in these TPVs. So we're seeking comment on whether we should eliminate the TPV altogether as a method to uh, verify a carrier switch, or whether we should implement certain changes to our TPV requirements to make it more difficult um, to fabricate them. And one of those changes that we suggested might be that you require the consumer to actually list the telephone numbers that they're going to change, because 
it's it'll be more difficult for the um, fraudulent companies to get you to repeat all your business's telephone numbers on a fraudulent call, say a post office call, than it would be for them just to say, is this your current address? And you say yes. So when they splice the TPV, they say you're changing this phone number, and all they have to do is splice in the splice in the yes. So perhaps having you repeat your phone numbers would make it more difficult to um, fabricate the TPV. Another thing we're thinking about with the TBV is certifying these third-party verifiers, um, potentially either through the commission or some other way to make sure they're actually a, a third party. Some of the enforcement uh, actions we've taken, we've seen um, carriers that don't even use a real third party. They just make the tapes up themselves and submit them. Um, so perhaps certifying the verifiers would be a, um, a step toward making that a little more difficult to do. Um, so that basically is a summary of what the MPRM seeks. And as I said, we got comments last week, and we're expecting reply comments in October. Um, and we'll see where it goes. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Steve, and then Paul. Hi, this is Steve with ACI. I, when slamming occurs, are we talking about um, companies that are actually um, have infrastructure, or are we talking about essentially resellers? The ones that the Enforcement Bureau has dealt with most recently are resellers, switchless resellers. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it just makes sense that consumers should be initiating these things. Right. But anyway, thanks. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Do you have any data broken out in terms of slamming and cramming complaints by Lifeline customers? I'm not aware of that, but I think the system is capable of doing that, our complaint system, because um, when consumers file slamming complaints, so they select that as their issue, but if they mention Lifeline in that, that can become a tag, so that's something we could look at and find. Any other questions? Anyone on the phone have a question? Uh, well, I'll go on to Ash County. Um, uh, uh, suggesting that's more than a question. Uh, it, it, I like the idea about um, acquiring carriers to accord the sales calls. It might be useful to also acquire the carriers to at least those according to the consumer so the consumer can verify what's on them or uh, you know, react to it. I was talking with someone not a carrier the other day about uh, who claimed they were recording the call, asked to get the recording, they wouldn't give it to me. So I think that maybe that uh, the, we put these uh, uh, the scammers on the spot to acquire them to actually give up the recording to the consumer. I agree. I think that's a good point. Thank you. This one on the right. I think if you... Raise your hand. Anyone just talk loud? I was just raising my hand. Right here. Hi. Sorry, Katie McCall of Americans Protection Forum. I came in a little bit late. Um, I had two questions for you. One about the carriers calling back to verify um, that folks actually wanted to switch. Can you explain why that was an issue to having people verify in the past? And then also in talking about the slamming and cramming from um, so costs that appear on consumers' bills that they're not really sure where they come from. Have any of those complaints come from consumers where they found out that it was like tax bills that they weren't aware of when they first signed up for a service or something like that? Thanks. All right. So with respect to the <laughs> I'll start with the second one, actually. Um, yes, we have seen complaints come in where there are taxes and fees that become that are the, the charges that they don't recognize. Um, and usually those are resolved through the complaint process. The carrier will write back and say, yes, you're, you're right, that was a tax or a fee, but it's valid and here's why, and you'll see it on your bill going forward. Um, so, but there are distinct ones that are charges that are for services that they did, did not authorize. So, I mean, I think that's fair. So, all right, I forgot the, sec the first one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the first one was why um, Re verification. Why not able to. Right. I think that's because um, it provided them with a win back opportunity uh, and they would do it for retention type of purposes. 
So in the NPRM, we have a fairly lengthy discussion about um, how we would ensure that that doesn't happen if we allow some type of re-verification. Um, another thing that we raised in the NPRM is, does it make sense to have a default pick freeze and the re-verification, or are they basically the same thing and we only need one? And if we only need one, which one do we need? But yeah, it was basically a retention marketing issue. So is there any worry that maybe the multiple phone calls could be an issue with, like, say, people who think maybe it's a TCPA violation mm -hmm. or, like, how do we work through that contacting for legitimate causes versus harassment? Right, and I think one of the things you mentioned, it doesn't necessarily have to be a phone call either. Okay. Um, you could send an email. You could do contact the consumer in other ways, um, and how would we – ensure that that was done in a timely manner because one of the other things that was an issue when re-verification was first discussed is if the existing carrier takes too long to make that um, call or re-verification, maybe the consumer changes their mind and therefore, you know, the new carriers lost the, the customer. Steve, again, uh, just a quick thought about the about the win back issue. I mean, I knew that where that was going, but what's wrong with having the... Uh, uh, the original provider offer a better deal to <laughs> customers, but just a thought. Anyways. Well, the new provider doesn't like it very much, so. Well. <laughs> Jocelyn. Hi. You talked about bundled customers, and I'm just wondering, for those companies that bill for other services, in the context of cramming, if a bundled customer sees a bill sees a charge on their bill for another service that the company bills for that they don't recognize. Is there enforcement action there? There can be. I mean, that's not what our enforcement um, actions that have surrounded these two issues have focused on. But yes, I think there can be. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? On the phone? Thanks for joining us. We do have a working group that's formed around this, and we will be giving some thought to the NPRM and issues in the space. So. Good. Please feel free to reach out to me if you need to. Great. Thank you. Thanks. So, in keeping with July 2017 meeting NPRMs, uh, which was a busy, busy consumer month uh, on the commission agenda, um, we're now going to have an overview or a review and overview of the call authentication trust, trust anchor NOI. Uh, Ken Carlberg, who is the chief technologist for Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, is here with us, as well as. Ann Stevens. Ann Stevens, who is the Deputy Division Chief for the Competition Policy Division of the Wireline Competition Bureau. Thank you both. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, so um, I was asked to be here for maybe some questions and answers regarding a trust anchor. So I thought I'd start off with a little bit of background, uh, like what is a trust anchor and why are we here? Uh, and what I'll try and do is maybe go back in history progressively and then circle back to where we are now. Uh, last year at the robocalling uh, task force, it was divided into four different tasks. And one of those involved uh, the standards and protocols uh, that one could uh, build upon and use in order to trust the phone number, uh, the trust in the number in which I'm receiving uh, the calling party. Uh, and so that part uh, was divided really into two different standards bodies. One is the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and the other is ADIS. Um, the division of labor there really focused uh, and goes back even earlier than that uh, with the IETF, which is the standards body that focuses on the core set of protocols that we use in the Internet and next generation networks used by uh, the carriers today. Um, we have a protocol known by SIP uh, or referred to as SIP, the Session Initiation Protocol. 
and my apologies for all these acronyms that come through. Uh, if I get quizzed, I'm not going to remember all of them. <laughs> so um, the, the SIP protocol is the one that we use uh, over IP networks to establish, tear down uh, calls over the network there. Uh, a number of years ago, about I think 10 years ago, they had tried and put together uh, a mechanism that would provide a measure of trust. But the trust was really focusing on domains, you know, example.com. And it didn't get into the specifics of do I trust this actual phone number that is being used uh, to originate the call. And so Henning uh, Scholzring, uh, about three years ago, I believe, uh, had put together a task force here at the FCC and brought in a number of uh, stakeholders uh, to bring up the issue and, and come up with and really try and promote the idea of how can we put in some more specific trust into these phone numbers. And that went into the arena of both adding uh, mechanisms or actually uh, extending some of the standards and protocols that we have uh, for SIP as well as introducing the concept of a digital certificate, uh, an entity or uh, information where the trust is uh, placed. So with a digital certificate, uh, we see a lot of these with uh, the web browsers. Um, you know, the, the question then becomes, well, who's issuing those certificates? And uh, while the IETF worked on the mechanisms, the actual framework, uh, how we accomplish that, uh, some of the policies and uh, the potential regulations, it steps away from. It's, it doesn't have an interest in that, and that's where ADIS stepped in and defined a uh, framework. The, the working group from uh, the ITF was uh, STIR, uh, which is the uh, Secure Telephony uh, Identity Revisited. Oh, I got that one. And, of course, naturally, the, uh, the work in ADIS was known as SHAKEN. So it's the James Bond of uh, robocalling uh, attempts here. Um, they do have a sense of humor at these uh, places here. So um, with that, uh, the shaken then came up with some additional aspects like, uh, you know, who would be able to use these or request these type of certificates. Uh, I think they had come with uh, an idea that uh, we'll use the OCN, the operator carrier number, as a means of uh, providing that. But then the question, is, again, went back to, uh, you know, who is the certificate authority, the, the root certificate authority? And we generally refer to that entity as the trust anchor. The trust starts from that point and then emanates down. And you can have certificate authorities delegate uh, additionally and further down. Um, but we start with, uh, with that trust anchor. And so um, after looking at uh, the particular area and uh, a number of folks coming to the commission uh, to talk about this, given the relationship of numbers uh, and our authority in that area, um, the wireless WCB folks uh, came up with uh, an NOI to ask some questions, uh, keeping in mind that the standard to work is produced predominantly by engineers. Uh, ADIS is uh, comprised uh, a lot by the carriers and vendors, but by bringing in an NOI and bringing in some more general questions, we can ask, uh, you know, is this a right approach to take? Are there concerns? Are there things that are missing, or should we just uh, plow ahead with this, uh, with this approach? And so that is sort of where we are today. Uh, I believe the comment section or comment period has ended. And so, um, you know, the commission is going over those comments uh, to see what we have um, and to uh, possibly progress from there. So I'm the engineer, and I will pass the, the rest to Anne, at least in terms of uh, uh, any of the, uh, the, the direction or other, um, I guess, policy questions related to the commission. Uh, are there questions or concerns from that? Scott, or a question from the audience? <laughs> yeah, or on the phone. Oh, I couldn't have done that good of a job. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if, if there are questions afterwards, oh, please, yes. Sorry, I'm not an engineer, so I'm <laughs> 
try to explain this as best I can. Uh, do you know if the solutions that these standards bodies are looking at, are they relying on open source software, or is there anything that's proprietary to, say, carriers or, so or what, other groups? No, very good question. So the, the IETF standards are open. Anyone can download them and see them. And um, uh, ADIS worked with the SIP forum uh, to be able to produce uh, an open standard. Normally, ADIS standards are available just to their clients, or I'm sorry, their members. Uh, but that standard as well uh, is open to uh, the public. And so from that, uh, one can build, uh, given those standards, ideally interoperable solutions. Uh, as a side note, we had um, a fellow uh, professor from Georgetown University actually came in before the NOI was uh, issued and uh, brought in one of his students, undergraduate students, who had um, actually put together an implementation on this trust anchor. And it took him about three months, but one has to also take in consideration that uh, the student was using open source software uh, for the first time. He had to get acclimated to it add uh, the software uh, corresponding to the standards, and then test it. And was able to accomplish that. So I think that is maybe provides a, a, a reasonable high level of confidence that the approach that's been uh, produced uh, has a good chance of, um, of being established. So, and if there, if there are any afterwards, or if there are any other questions, we'll be happy to uh, uh, answer them as best we can. Thank you. Nothing. 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 Um, so, a follow up on, on that then. Uh, if it took somebody three months with open source technology to prove, to do like a proof of performance, I guess? A prototype. A prototype, yes. right. Is that also likely to be something that somebody could sort of reverse engineer within a three-month time period and find a workaround? Where am I missing? No, in the sense that um, if, in a sense, you have that uh, that trust tanker, that certificate authority, uh, let's say we took it in a different approach. If we had someone who built uh, software for web browser and they're using the certificates from another entity. Uh, sure, you could reverse uh, engineer the browser, uh, but the certificate and its mechanism and how you validate it, verify it, uh, still remains the same. So ideally, uh, the design is there to uh, work, you know, regardless of whether the, the, we have open source or not. And the other reason for our uh, questions in the NOI was to bring this to the broader community um, that involves or includes, in a sense, those that deals with certificates and certificate uh, dissemination. Uh, we also actually did have another uh, group that came in. I, I'm i sorry, I, I forget the name, but uh, they deal with uh, providing certificates. So having, in a sense, uh, an open record and uh, a mechanism for providing uh, responses uh, from more general uh, populace is is helpful in that. Does anyone on the phone have any call, any questions? Okay. Thank you both. You're okay. So next up, we have lunch, um, and. <laughs> Lunch is available in the room here, and we will once again thank U.S. Telecom, Lynn and Kevin, for providing us with food today. I very much appreciate it. Uh, please keep in mind that this afternoon at 1.10, we will have a vote on a recommendation, and in order to be able to do that, we do need quorum. So I know some people might have to leave and maybe rejoining by phone, and some people on the phone might be coming in to join us for the afternoon. Uh, but please just try to be here or on the phone at 1.10 p.m. so that we can get that recommendation passed with by having a quorum, or at least have a legitimate vote on it by having a quorum. But we also have two uh, presentations uh, before that vote, one at uh, 12.30 and the one at 12.50. Um, 
that you would not want to miss either. So if you could be back in the room exactly. by 1250, and that would be great. I did not mean that anyone would want to miss those presentations, <laughs> but uh, we will restart the program at 1230. Enjoy lunch, and feel free to stay in the room if you need to. Uh, lunch is for primary members and their designated alternates who are here. Um, so please keep that in mind. If anybody else needs an escort or help getting to another place in the building that provides lunch, please talk to Scott or I and we will make sure somebody can work with you. Thank you. And thank you again to U.S. Telecom for providing food for us today. Very much appreciated. Uh, I did forget to do one thing this morning, so I want to insert that here now. I, I did want to thank, uh, thank you to Eric Knoll and his colleagues over at OTI. Um, they decided to step away from the CAC uh, within the, since our last meeting, but I did want to make sure I took a moment to acknowledge their participation, their insights, and all their help over the last few years while they served on the CAC. So apologies for not doing that first thing today, but I wanted to make sure it was part of the part of the items that we covered today. Next up, we're going to have a review of another July 2017 <laughs> NPRM. Again, July was an active month here on consumer topics. Um, this one deals with rural call completion. And we're happy to be joined by Adam Copeland, who's Assistant Division Chief for the Competition Policy Division of the Wireline Competition Bureau, and David Brody, who's an Attorney Advisor for the Competition Policy Division of the Wireline Competition Bureau. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Great to be with you all. So as Ed said, what we're going to be doing today is not just looking at that July NPRM, though that will certainly be part of our presentation. We're going to try to give you guys an overview of the lay of the RCC land, sort of where we've been, where we're at now, where things are potentially going, both here in this building and up on Capitol Hill, uh, where this has been a, an issue of interest for quite some time. So I'm actually going to turn it over to David, who's going to give our presentation, and then uh, we'll, we'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Oh, and yes, we have a, um, there should be a handout in your packet that uh, is a roll call completion fact sheet that should uh, mention uh, many of the things that, that David's going to go through, um, but you'll have that as, as some reference material both for here. It's a nice present to take home. Right side of the folder, very last page. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to start with some brief background over what roll call completion is, and then I'm going to go through some of the commission's actions previously and currently. So like many aspects of telecommunications, uh, rural areas sometimes have increased challenges with call completion for a variety of reasons related to their remoteness. The Commission is committed to ensuring that long distance calls to all Americans, including rural Americans, are completed. RCC problems tend to manifest in a variety of ways. It can be delays in the call, no getting no ringtone, dropped calls, false ringtones, busy signals, uh, just a variety of different ways of a call not completing properly. Uh, because rural areas are remote and have lower population density, it is expensive to deliver long distance calls to them. While there appear to be multiple factors that cause rural call completion problems, one key factor that we've identified is that a call to a rural area is often ham handled by numerous different intermediate providers in the call path. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how rural calls are routed. In most instances, the originating local exchange carrier uh, does not hand off a call directly to the terminating LEC. Most of the time, one or more intermediate providers are in the call path. Sometimes there might be many intermediate providers in the call path, and the call is handed off several times from beginning to end. Uh, why are there so many people in the call path? Uh, because most providers or many providers use something called least cost routing. Uh, given the higher rates long distance providers incur to terminate long distance calls to rural carriers, long distance providers have an incentive to reduce the cost of routing calls. 
Under lease cost routing, carriers choose to hand off their calls to the intermediate provider who promises to complete the call at the lowest cost. Often the cheapest route is not the most direct or reliable. Uh, when there are lots of handoffs in the call path, lots of intermediate providers, the risk of call failure increases. If there are only one or two handoffs, the originating carrier can more easily monitor intermediate <coughs> provider performance. Uh, if additional intermediate providers are used, call path transparency to the originating provider decreases. When calls are expensive to complete, there is potentially less incentive to ensure they are actually completed properly. So the Commission has been looking at this issue for a number of years, uh, beginning in uh, 2011 with the adoption of the USF ICC transformation order. Uh, the transition plan adopted in that order should reduce the ability to arbitrage rates by failing to complete rural calls. Over time, this should remediate a lot of RCC issues, we hope. Uh, in the past, the Wireline Competition Bureau has issued a couple of declaratory rulings that clarified that the Communications Act prohibits carriers from blocking, choking, reducing, or restricting calls, including to avoid termination charges. The Enforcement Bureau has also undertaken a, a number of investigations and entered into five consent decrees related to RCC problems uh, with Verizon, Matrix Telecom, Windstream, Level 3, and InContact. These actions have assessed $6.45 million in penalties and voluntary contributions. In 2013, the Commission uh, adopted the first rule call completion order. Uh, to set up a data collection, retention, and reporting uh, regime. Covered providers under, this, under these rules, and covered providers means originating carriers with at least 100,000 lines. Uh, covered providers were required to collect and categorize specific data about their call completion performance, such as whether each call was answered, busy, ring no answer, et cetera. Um, if anyone is interested, the docket number for that order and, and this matter generally is 13-39. Uh, the first order also set up a safe harbor uh, from the data collection regime where covered providers could stop reporting data after one year if they ple first pledged to use no more than two intermediate providers in their call path, second, monitored their intermediate provider performance, and third, had transparency with respect to the identities of their intermediate providers. So if they had good visibility over their operations, uh, they could qual potentially qualify for the safe harbor. And uh, some carriers have opted to do that. Uh, covered providers reported data quarterly for two years, beginning in 2015. Uh, the, R the 2013 order called on the Wireli Wireline Bureau to issue a report analyzing the first two years of data, which we just released this past June. And uh, it required the commission to complete a follow-up rulemaking to address whether to keep, modify, or eliminate the data collection and reporting rules, or to take other actions related to rule call completion, um, which is why we just issued an FMPRM. And the chairman has publicly stated that he intends to complete this follow-on rulemaking by April 2018. The report that we issued on June 22nd uh, analyzed the first two years of RCC data. Uh, it made a number of findings. It found that the aggregate call answer rate was slightly lower, about two percentage points, in rural areas versus non-rural areas. Inconsistencies between rural and non-rural call completion aggregate call answer rates, that's a mouthful, are most likely due to issues with individual provider performance rather than a systemic problem. The data was found overall, however, to be somewhat unreliable because of variations in how covered providers reported their data and in the types of data they were reporting. Such variations precluded the Bureau from drawing firm conclusions from this data. The requirement to report data to the Commission did not appear to cause an improvement in aggregate call answer rates in rural areas. 
Um, and the report found that if the commission were to modify the data collection to address data quality issues, it's unclear whether the benefits of such modifications would outweigh the costs. The report recommended either eliminating or modifying the data collection regime. On July 14th, the commission adopted the RCC's second further notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, which seeks comment on a number of issues, including whether the Commission should adopt new rules that would, co that would <coughs> consistent with industry best practices, require covered providers to monitor roll call performance of their intermediate providers, and hold their intermediate providers accountable for poor performance. Uh, the NPRM uh, seeks comment on eliminating or modifying the existing RCC data collection rules or alternatively retaining the recording and retention requirements but eliminating the reporting requirement. Uh, seeks comment on whether small providers should be exempted from any new requirements applicable to providers as a whole uh, as well as how to proceed with our existing safe harbor rule or how any new safe harbor regime should be structured. Uh, and the, uh, the NPRM also seeks comment generally on any other recommendations that anyone such as this committee may have on how to address RCC issues. In the background of the Commission's action, there is also legislation pending in Congress uh, with bipartisan sponsors. Uh, HR 460, the Improving Rural Call Quality and Reliability Act of 2017, passed the House of Representatives on January 23rd. Uh, S96, a bill with the same name and identical language, passed the Senate on August 3rd and was referred to the House the next day, so the legislation is somewhat far along. The legislation requires intermediate providers to register with the Commission and comply with service quality standards to be set by the Commission. It prohibits covered providers from using unregistered intermediate providers. And it specifies that covered providers who are also intermediate providers, uh, meaning they serve multiple roles in the ecosystem, uh, do not need to comply with intermediate provider service quality standards if they are certified already as a safe harbor provider. Uh, the legislation gives the commission six months to set up the intermediate provider registry and 12 months to set service quality standards from the date of enactment. Thank you very much, and happy to answer any questions you all have. Steve? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Steve with ACI. Uh, there's a question you talked about, the completion rates and, of uh, rural versus um, uh, urban areas. What is the completion rate um, for origination versus termination in rural areas? I, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Okay, so uh, what your focus here is is rural call completion, right? Right. Right. But people who live in rural areas also originate calls. Right. What's that completion? S hmm. So I don't think that we have separate. I don't think the data has been computed to separately um, look at that because that's not how it's reported to us. So. Um, a covered provider that's operating in a rural area would report their data to us aggregated. I mean, they, they do have to report by OCN, but um, I don't believe we've performed uh, those calculations. Uh, I, I'm, I'm only asking because I'm curious about the differences in the access uh, charges between originating and terminating and whether this is really about quality of service or, or, or it's the money is creating the, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, results you're seeing. That's. I was just. Uh, I was just wondering to see if that had been explored. Yeah, I think traditionally, it's a. It's a great question. That traditionally, I think the problem has been thought about um, as as a terminating issue. Um, that, that has traditionally been the focus. Um, but but that that's that's a very interesting question that uh, we can we can see if if the data uncovers anything there. And uh, we did find in the report that over the last few years, complaints generally for RCC have decreased over time, uh, but we are still getting complaints. And 
to the extent that any of the potential improvements are due to changes from the 2011 ICC USF order, uh, that might be consistent. Irene? So this is Amitka Herrera on the phone with Natoa in Montgomery County. Go ahead, Mitzi. Uh, I, was, I wanted a couple questions. I wanted to understand, is the suggestion that you would eliminate the requirements or you'd eliminate taking the complaints? So uh, what's being discussed in the NPRM is eliminating or modifying the data collection uh, recording and reporting requirements uh, that covered providers currently have to comply with. Uh, the NPRM is not proposing any changes to uh, the existing consumer complaint methods. Uh, so consumers can still file complaints just the same as before. Um, although, if, Okay, and know. then in, I understand that. Then in the NPRM, did you, based on the information that you have reported, how big of a problem is it? How many instances were there? Of, of rural call completion failures? Yes. So I, I think it's one – of, one of the messages of the report is it's, I think, difficult to determine that with, with any certainty, which is why we looked at things on an aggregate basis. And as, as David talked about, the, the delta between call completion uh, issues in urban areas versus, urban, uh, versus rural areas was, was fairly small, but we presented that data point with the rather large caveat that we were not all that confident in the underlying reliability of the data for a number of reasons that the report uh, discusses. So, I mean, we don't have a set number of, of how many um, call completion uh, failures there, there were. Yeah, on, on, a, uh, percentage, on a percentage basis, the uh, data report uh, concluded that the aggregate call answer rate in rural areas was 64.3%, which was slightly lower than the aggregate call answer rate in non-rural areas of 68.8%. And it's the, the median call answer rates between the rural and non-rural areas that had about a 2 percentage point difference. Uh, so we don't have hard numbers on the total number of calls that experienced problems. Uh, but we have sort of uh, other metrics. Okay, but are you, so, but are you saying then that roughly that either that there is a a, a two or four percent difference in the call between rural and non-rural areas? That is what the uh, limited data available to us suggests. Although with with the caveat that. The report did find that there was a number of data quality issues, and so okay, right. So if you, okay, yeah, so, if you, but based on that, do you have an estimate on the number of calls? Is that is that a hundred thousand? Is that a million? Ballpark. Do you mean the the number of calls that were reported in the data set? Yes. Uh, that was not that was not in the report. No. But I, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, on your website, in the complaint data for rural call completion, there are 288 complaints that were filed with the FCC. How does that compare with the data that you have if you assume that there's a problem of, say, 2%? What does that 2% mean in, in a hard number? So that, that, that 2%, would, to be clear about that 2% figure, that, that was not stating that 2% of all calls to rural areas don't complete. That was compare that that was a comparison between urban urban completion rates and rural completion rates. Right. So, I mean, the issue of I mean, one of the things that the data report found with respect to enforcement complaints was that that we were encountering a difficulty using the data collection to inform Enforcement, and so that is one of the reasons why the why the uh, Wireline Bureau recommended seeking comment 
on how to either improve the data collection to make it more suitable for enforcement purposes or possibly scrapping it because it wasn't fulfilling or, or was having difficulty fulfilling uh, that function. Do you have any information about how big a problem this is? In well, we, we have the, compl the, the best indicator that we have, which is granted anecdotal because it is informed by complaints, is, is the complaint data. And there are, you know, and providers informally contact us, um, to, you know, and contact the Enforcement Bureau as well to report issues. We have anecdotal evidence through the decrease in complaints and also, you know, there have been discussions, there's been public uh, RCC workshops, uh, including one that Verizon held pursuant to their um, uh, consent decree that do suggest that the problem is getting better but we do not have the data doesn't allow us to get a, give us a hard number and and as the report sort of found or concluded uh, we don't at this time think that uh, the remaining problems are a systemic issue we think it's particularized to specific providers and, and more localized issues Okay, I guess I'm trying to square this up with, in a separate proceeding, the commission is looking at, for cable television, and the quality of complaints, uh, the quality of the signal, and whether providers should have to actually do performance tests. And in that NPRM, they stated, because they didn't get many complaints, that they don't think they should have performance tests. And the commission has over 2,400 complaints about that issue. But for the rural call completion, you have 288 complaints. So my question is, is this an issue that actually requires additional action or based on the idea that if you don't get many complaints, it isn't a problem, should the issue just be dropped? We, I mean, I think that the commission was pretty clear in July that the commission views roll call completion to be a issue that is still problematic. Um, we know it's of interest as well to Congress as they have pending legislation that's fairly far along. So it's still, you know, as evidenced by the release of, of the NPRM, it's still a priority for the commission. Right. And, and what we're trying to do at this point is follow up on the 2013 order that set these data collection rules in place. Uh, if the data report has indicated that the current data collection rules are no longer necessary, uh, the NPRM we're currently considering raises the possibility of removing those rules and putting into place a more flexible set of requirements. But, the, but I mean, da David is right to point out that the, the impetus for this NPRM, or FNPRM rather, is the commitment that was made back in 2013 to evaluate the data collection by April 2018. So, you know, the course of action obviously hasn't been set. We're, we're considering a number of proposals that were both raised, you know, in the NPRM itself and are coming in the record. Um, so, you know, no course of action has been decided, but the impetus for this action was actually a commitment ba made back in 2013. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that you're following up on your commitment. I would just leave it that I think that coming up with some kind of at least ballpark figure it helps understand, you know, there are 100,000, there are a million calls to rural areas that are dropped would be helpful to understand the importance of the issue. I mean, I, I, I don't think that we disagree, and I think that that was the intent of the data collection. But as the report points out, there were a number of, of issues with the data collection that were obviously not foreseen in 2013 when it was adopted. And you know, through the benefit now of hindsight, we can see that there were some issues. We probably would have set it up differently had we known there were going to be problems back then. So, I mean, ideally, we would have been able to use the data collection to, you know, more quantify the problem, as you're suggesting, Mitzi. But, you know, we, we kind of are where we are. And so the commission has to determine, you know, are we going to keep this data collection? Are we going to reform it? Or, are, or do we need to take other regulatory action? Um, or do we need to wait for Congress to step in it, it, as they may? All right, and I, I think that's good that you're looking at that, and I appreciate that sometimes you put out things and it isn't until you get back the data that you determine whether you ask the right questions, and I applaud you for actually going back to see whether we should ask different questions. But I would just point out, 
and note that I think the FCC should be consistent if the fact that you only have 288 complaints about rural call completion is not evidence that this is not a small and insignificant problem, then the commission should not rely on the numerical amounts of complaints provided in other proceedings to suggest that there is no problem because we don't have many complaints and they should instead follow what you're doing in this case, which is to figure out how can we get better data collection. Irene. Irene Leach with the Consumer Federation of America. I, I've got several questions. When you said that the cost of collecting the data or making the changes might outweigh the benefit, cost to who, benefits to who, how do we measure that? Sure. I mean, the, the cost being referred to is the covered providers who are having to pay to set up the regime that allows them to uh, actually report the data. The benefit is is to consumers and, you know, and, and, you know, allowing the commission to actually use the data in a way that could benefit consumers to help assist with resolving RCC problems. Right now, the WCB data report suggests that the data as is currently being collected is not a good vehicle for doing that. So um, basically it's saying there is this implementation cost that the providers are currently absorbing. There doesn't appear to be any benefit to the commission, to consumers, to the provider as, um, as a result of this data collection. So what should we do? But does that, uh, I guess I was taking it if the co of, if cost of changes made it more expensive for providers, my concern was that you would decide not to do it, decide and kind of like Mitzi's saying there don't seem to be numerically many complaints. I, I wonder, you know, with the percentage, because there aren't as many people in rural areas as, they, as there are in others, um, and, and I worry that it could get pushed aside as being too expensive for the providers, but that the consumers are still going to be facing the problem. Right. So, so, I mean, I think it's important to remember that, you know, we, we have the regulations that are currently in effect, which really just deal at the moment with this reporting and record-keeping regime. So the FNPRM, the second FNPRM, asks, you know, in light of the WCB data report that says we're not sure how effective these things are, should we continue with these rules as they are currently in place or should we modify them? Or should we look at other solutions, either in addition to or instead of? So the, the commission is committed to pursuing something that hopefully works. Uh, the suggestion of the WCB data report is the data collection in its current form isn't working. It does contemplate possibly modifying the collection. The, the question that we're trying to solve is, can you come up with a modification that is actually going to help the commission with enforcement, that is actually going to enable the commission to study this in a better way? Um, we're, we're not sure at this point whether that exists or not. That's why the record is open. That's why we're receiving comments. That's what we're digesting. I think the, the idea of weighing the cost and benefits <laughs> is we're not just going to modify the collection without figuring out is it actually, you know, we're not just going to take another shot in the dark at trying to get it right. We're going to try to, you know, re if we're going to reform the collection, we, we want to do it in an in informed way that's actually going to lead to benefits for consumers at the end of the day, which and is different from saying, you know, we're not going to do anything. <laughs> okay. And re related to that, I'm, I'm curious um, if you have ideas about ways that could more effectively uh, address it and, and what service quality service standards you're uh, thinking about um, at this point? So, did, did you want to? So, I mean, so, so the, um, the initial proposal or initial, uh, yeah, proposal that is discussed in the FNPRM uh, would, as David was saying, it would ad adopt rules under this proposal 
that would require um, covered providers to actually monitor their intermediate providers and to take action and hold intermediate providers accountable when those intermediate providers were not sufficiently delivering calls, um, which is different. I mean, that could be viewed possibly as a general requirement, but the view that is asked about in the FNPRM is, is this a more direct way to get at the issue? Instead of requiring this sort of passive data collection, should we instead hold covered providers more accountable in saying to their intermediate providers, hey, here's a problem, you need to go fix it. Um, as the service quality standards that you're referencing, are are those the ones that are contemplated in the legislation? Or or are you using that term more, more generally? I'm, I'm actually using it more generally in terms of what you'd be you're thinking about there. So so one of the things we see comment on is uh, ADIS has a, a call completion handbook that discusses a number of uh, best practices. Uh, we discuss some of them in the NPRM and see comment on whether <laughs> any of those should be formally codified uh, as requirements. Um, and we are certainly open to other ideas about other potential service quality standards that should be incorporated. If anyone else has other ideas, we're all ears. And with respect to the intermediate service quality standards, if the that are contemplating the legislation, <clears throat> if that legislation is adopted, we would have to issue another and an, well, another FNPRM seeking comment about what those would look like as well. You don't think there's something already in existence that would serve the purpose? Well, I mean, as David was mentioning, there is the ADIS right. guidelines. Um, there is debate already in our record as to whether or not yeah. those should be mandated or whether or not those would be helpful. I mean, I think at this point we're collecting information as to whether or not we should use ADIS, whether we should use something else, whether we shouldn't do anything, whether we shouldn't use anything at all. I know this is a very important issue, and Mark, you've had yours up for a while, so if we could have one more question from Mark, and then this is something that the USF Working Group is going to be giving thought to, so hopefully there might be an opportunity for you to meet directly with that working group and have a longer, more in-depth conversation. Mark. Yeah, um, I wanted to follow up a little bit with what Steve was saying, and uh, or at least his, his, you know, where he was going, and to me, and maybe I'm... You know, I have a tendency on, uh, on occasion to oversimplify things, but this seems to me that it is strictly a financial issue. You have very high access charges in terminating access in rural areas, and therefore the providers do not want to terminate the calls because they have to pay the access charges. So rather than try to put in measurements and um, best practices and everything else, it, as, as the access charges go down, I think the problem goes away. And so if you're looking at measurements and things and you know, trying to come up with ways of determining the number of calls that are maybe not being completed or put in practices and things. It, it just seems to me it's a financial issue. It's not really a technological issue that the calls can't be completed. It's that there's a financial incentives for uh, financial incentive for the providers not to complete those calls because they're going to rural areas where it's very high access rates. So um, it just seems that the way to address this is from the financial perspective, get the terminating access rates down, uh, and then the problem goes away. And Steve, on the, on the originating side of the call, uh, you can't prevent um, the, the customer from making a call, so the originating access charges are going to be uh, incurred no matter what, so whether you, tra you, you um, terminate the call or not, it's, you know, that's always going to be there. So it just seems to me it's a financial issue. Am I, am I wrong on that? I mean, that's entirely possible. It's uh, consistent with what's in the data report. It's not the only possible explanation, but it's consistent with what we know. Thank but you. I mean, if you know, one thing I would note is that our record is still open. Um, replies are actually not due until next week. So um, you know, to the extent um, I, I know this body makes recommendations and conclusions as a body, but to the extent that any of your um, organizations or you in, as individuals want to submit comments into the record to that effect or to any effect, you know, we would welcome that either, you know, at the reply stage or even uh, obviously we continue to accept submissions after the reply deadline as well. But we encourage your uh, participation either as a group or, or as individual organizations. Right. I, I think we're going to have to end it there since we're pretty far over now. Thank you both sure. for coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you.
I don't know what happened to my key card for the good doctor. For the good doctor. That's what I thought too. Okay, so next up we have um, a presentation that some people have requested a couple times over the years, and we actually at one point on the CAC had um, some medical representatives and had a working group devoted at least loosely to connected health issues. Um, we're very happy to get an update today on the FCC's Connect to Health public notice, and Dr. Chris Gibbons, who's a physician advisor here at the FCC, is going to provide that for us. So welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, as most of you know, uh, uh, the world is changing around us. Um, the way we bank, the way we shop, the way we travel, even how we get our education and employment is drastically changing from the time when we originally started and certainly our, our, our parents, and it will be different for our children. The world is becoming, we, we are living more of our lives online, like it or not, like it or not. It's coming, it's here. Um, and this is beginning to happen in the health sector as well. The health sector has been uh, one of the slowest to adopt, to move into this area, but it is happening uh, and will continue to happen for a while. Uh, the FCC um, is very has taken the, uh, the the stance that they are. It's very important to ensure that broadband health. Uh, opportunities are available to all uh, Americans, especially those living in rural areas and, uh, and in other underserved areas, such as tribal lands or individuals um, with special needs, seniors, elderly, uh, those living with disabilities, uh, and there are others. Even people who are homeless, you might not know that a significant number of homeless people uh, actually carry cell phones and find ways to keep them uh, active, actually. They may live under the bus or under the bridge, but they have a cell phone. I actually am in communication with a patient right now, right now, uh, that that he we were in phone communication. He's actually lost minutes, but he still has texting capability. He's actually living on the street right now, and I have been uh, communicating with him for the past several weeks. Um, so the reality, the unfortunate reality uh, that, that we are aware is that disparities exist, differences uh, in access, adoption, and outcomes across uh, populations. Um, those living in rural and underserved areas, those from these special populations are often less likely to have broadband infrastructure uh, available to them they, are, they have lower adoption rates and therefore are unable to benefit from what broadband health tools and technologies have to offer. And in the case of health care, then that means that their health uh, tends to suffer. And this is really a special problem in health care. Well, currently in our healthcare system, uh, unfortunately, it often does not provide the highest quality of care consistently uh, to people living in these situations and from uh, these backgrounds or these populations. And we believe, I personally believe, and, and a growing number of people believe that technology and broadband-based technologies offer huge potential uh, to help close these gaps and uh, improve the health not only of those from these backgrounds and living in these situations, but help uh, help us all uh, with our health, manage our health concerns. Today, uh, we are talking about when when people talk about broadband-based technologies, they are often talking about uh, telemedicine or telehealth. You're probably familiar with that, the idea of using uh, video 
capture video communications and audio communications for a doctor or nurse or health professional uh, to communicate with a patient who's not in front of them, but could be down the street, across the city, or halfway around the world. All of those things are in place now, and they offer tremendous opportunity to, to bring uh, medical expertise and health care and services by way of using robotics. We can do the same thing, and uh, a surgeon here in Maryland can provide, can actually perform surgery on somebody on an operating uh, table in Africa or other places. This is happening already uh, today. Um, and so it's helping us overcome barriers, uh, particularly related to distance and time. And that's fascinating. But tomorrow, it's going to look even more different, the healthcare sector as well as our world. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about, and by the way, everything I'm about to tell you is already being worked on and deployed in some form or fashion. So I'm not talking about things that are 100 years down the road. But you may not have heard of these things. Tomorrow, we will be talking about uh, autonomous cars that not just drive themselves, um, but the cars that are, are able to detect health emergencies automatically become ambulances, wire ahead to the hospitals, and then take you to the hospital to save your life. Communicating with the traffic light systems to open up the way so that traffic does not become a problem. Tomorrow, we'll be talking about homes that deliver care to people at home from sensors and things that are built into the walls and the roofs that you don't see, you don't interact, you don't have to touch, you don't have to press a button, you don't have to do anything. They work automatically using artificial intelligence, algorithms, and all kinds of things um, to deliver care, in some cases, without you even knowing that you were delivered care, and in some cases, before you even realize you were sick. Tomorrow, we will have visual, uh, virtual health assistants that are available to us not when the doctor's office is open and not when I can get into an urgent care or a, a, a medical facility, but they'll be available to us when we need them 24-7 on our consumer's demand to discuss medical concerns and help us manage our issues. We'll have drones that are delivering medications to your doorsteps exactly when you need them and taking medical samples back to the hospital for testing to make sure therapy is going as it, as it should. I even just had a conversation with Scott Marshall who told me about an amazing technology that he's using now that is, it is offering uh, tremendous uh, health implications for people like him who are visually impaired. I could talk all day about that whole category of thing. But, but the point, the result is, the result of these uh, technologies and others coming on board, in my opinion and a growing number of people's opinion, is that it's going to in part lead to less care being delivered in hospitals. And we're already seeing that, right? More and more you, you, people cannot stay in the hospital for a procedure as long as they used to. So this is due to cost pressures. This is due to a lot of things. But technology will help enhance it. So there will be less care offered uh, in hospitals. There will be more care offered in homes and communities. And it will be offered by more people than just doctors and nurses caregivers, family caregivers, uh, you know, digital assistants, others will, will become real players in this care communities of the future. And it will have the cumul cumulative effect of making care smarter, more responsive, and on demand when consumers need it, whether that's 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 2 a.m. in the morning. Basically, it will make what is now impossible possible. This is particularly important for the underserved and for those for these uh, challenging populations because if we don't get it right, 
And if only some people and some populations are able to benefit, then the gaps will actually get bigger. The current gaps could get bigger because some populations are getting better and other populations are falling further behind. The gaps get bigger. The costs then go up for everyone. So this becomes a problem for everyone, not just for those in those populations. The costs go up for everyone. The available resources become overwhelmed and everyone suffers. So the Connect to Health Task Force at FCC is serving two primary functions. One, it is, new, it is now the new umbrella for all uh, FCC health-related activities. Uh, but it is also charged with exploring the intersection of broadband, advanced technologies, and health. And we've done, I'll just mention a couple of things. We've done a, a few things to try to get at this. We, in, uh, early on, we began what we called the Beyond the Beltway Tour, where we said, you know, the answers aren't all in Washington. Let's get out and talk to the people who are doing things. And we went on a 10-city tour around the country, talked with those innovators in the health sector that were doing things, and saw some amazing, saw some amazing people doing some amazing things, helping people and consumers with their health care. But we, we learned quickly that it's really hard to, to really look at this and say, how do you put technology with healthcare care uh, in a systematic way across the country and, and know where the needs are and know where we're making progress and, and know how things are better. And so we built a tool that's now available on the FCC site, uh, FCC.gov backslash health. You can find it. It's called Mapping Broadband Health in America Tool. And anybody can go there and, and you can choose any number of health problems and any number of telecommunications uh, issues and see what the situation is in terms of access, telecommunications access and health <coughs> indices for a given region or nationally or any, any size or scale. And you can change it any way you want to. It's, it's built uh, so that the average user can use. You don't have to be some sort of policy wonk or, or analytic guru, nothing against them at all, at all. Uh, but, but hopefully most Americans uh, can use it for a variety of purposes. Um, we also have and are in the process of doing uh, what we're calling some virtual listening sessions where we invite people who uh, and organizations and sectors who are not normally a part of FCC proceedings to talk to us and to tell us what we what what they think about these things. Uh, we have already had one focused on healthcare providers uh, and another one on I'm sorry I'm blanking on the second one. I think it's t uh, telecommunications providers. Um, we have two more coming up in uh, later later this month. Um, and finally, in April of 2017, this year, we, re we released a public notice uh, that was seeking inputs, input on several aspects uh, of accelerating adoption of broadband-based health technologies and reducing disparities. And the real goal of doing this was to gather information uh, from, the, from the public about the status of broadband health and to get input on potential recommendations and actions that the public would like to see the FCC take in this area. We're, ex we're especially interested in the consumer perspective, though, not just the perspective of professionals, <coughs> of doctors, of organizations, of telecommunications providers, but we really are interested in the perspective of consumers. Are consumers aware, really, are most consumers aware that broadband-based technologies can actually help them with their health. In what ways are consumers using uh, broadband-based technologies for health if they're using them at all right now? Is it just a few ways or is it many different ways? Um, what, what is and what, of what's out there, what is helpful and what is not from a consumer's perspective? What should the FCC do? What recommendations do consumers have about uh, what they would like to see the FCC do, and especially those consumers from these underserved populations. How can the FCC best interact with consumers in an ongoing fashion? What's the best way for us to speak directly to consumers and hear directly from consumers? And finally, 
what does success look like from a consumer's perspective? If this world were perfect and what we're doing here works perfectly, what would that mean to you as a consumer? And with that, I'll stop and be and, and I'm happy to take any questions. I'm going to start with Paul because we... Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I'm sort of <coughs> curious. You talked about these underserved populations. If uh, providers were, begin- were to, say, impose a 5% surcharge on folks' uh, phone bill, or sorry, broadband bill, for accessing the, these health care services, how would it affect those populations? So now you're talking about telecommunications providers, not medical providers, right? Correct. Okay, and you're saying charge them a, ser- a tax uh, to, to, to provide services to these pop- telecommunications uh, to provide, services? To provide access, yeah, to those health services, uh, access to the web portal, access to the yeah. telemedicine. That's so that's a good question. I think um, the, the, what we are finding is that the problem of low adoption rates is, has many parts to it. One part is infrastructure is not there. Uh, another part of it is, uh, in some cases, the costs are too high, um, uh, or for some. But but it but it's also uh, there are other aspects to that coin. Um, the technologies that may be available may not be the appropriate ones for the populations that are out there, or they may not be built uh, uh, the, the best way, or uh, the, 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 uh, the populations may need more of a human touch to get started, seniors, for example. Um, but, but, but I've talked to many seniors, and they, they're not, they didn't grow up in this world where uh, you know, they, they know and accept these technologies. But they get it. I, in their own words, they tell me, we get it. We, we're scared. We don't really know how to use these things. But if we don't get access, if we don't start using, we're just going to be left further behind. So it, it's a complicated process. I don't think any one thing is going to be the silver bullet to fix it. I do think <coughs> a number of things working together can make substantial improvements in the problem. And that is one of the things that can happen. But by itself, Alone, it would be difficult to, to 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 say what the impact would be today. But as part of a broader uh, construct of, of of tools, I think it's an important part. That is. Uh, yes, and responding to Paul, you mentioned the human touch, and my question is about the uh, what has what has been your experience with communication and outreach, particularly the trust factor. Um, you mentioned some seniors that would like to see um, these types of technology implemented. But how do you, what has been your experience with getting people to trust to relinquish control to a smart and interactive device? Have have people been more hesitant or more open to it? It's actually been a fast, I've had a fascinating, fascinating experience. I've dedicated uh, the last, you know, 20 years of my life to this topic in the healthcare space. Uh, as a physician at Johns Hopkins, working specifically with people in these populations, uh, whether they be urban or rural or visually impaired or, or, or others. And it's interesting. Yes, there is some, well, I'll give you a, a statistic first. Um, as an example, elderly uh, individuals are, as a group are the group that has the lowest utilization of these tools. And that's probably not surprising to most of us. But what you probably don't realize is they are the group that has the fastest rate of adoption. So they're not using because they didn't grow up with this stuff, but once they, for whatever reason, uh, get the assistance that they need, they're adopting faster than every other group out there, even the kids. So So what I found over the years is that, yeah, there's some hesitancy, there's some lack of, of, uh, of trust that's, that's out there. But for a number of reasons, one is they see the world passing them by. It's like in the early days, I knew a lot of people who said, I'll never do online banking. Never. Okay. <laughs> so you just have to get into the car and go to the bank every time you need something, whether snow, rain, whatever, and then oh, I can just do it on my app. Now it's precious few people who are not doing broad, broad um, but So, uh, again, the world is changing, and that is changing those, the people from these populations as well. But in addition to that, their needs are greater, and sometimes they may have the desire to do it, but they can't 
overcome those barriers. I'll give you one final example. So we did, I was involved in a study many, uh, several years ago where we placed some technology, some health-oriented technology in the homes of uh, low-income, in this case it was urban, uh, African Americans in the inner city. So they didn't have access at this time to any of this kind of stuff. They didn't have broadband in their home, whatever. We provided it for them for six months, had them interact with it, then, and, and we didn't have many, so we then would take them out of their homes and put them in other people's homes and sort of see what the experience was across the population. It blew me away, what, what I found. And you don't even know, need to know what it was about. But when we went to get those, those tools, it was sort of a box at that time, video and a few other things, um, these people were begging us not to take it. Some were crying. So this is the only interaction that I have with the outside world of substance, you know, talking with the doctor, being able to talk with a nurse through this video thing. They didn't want us to take it. These are the same seniors that had never used these things in their lives and didn't trust them before. So, it, again, similar to the other question, it's not just one simple answer on this, oh, people, people from minority groups or people from disabled, they don't trust it, they're not going to use it. There is mistrust. But we can overcome those things if we understand and learn those populations better, learn their needs, listen and work with them to overcome the challenges and provide what they need. And we will all benefit if we do. Say name. This is Zainab speaking from the National Association of the Deaf. You had mentioned that you have hosted virtual listening sessions, um, as your example you gave with providers. Do you have or do you plan to host other virtual listening sessions with specific consumer populations, for example, deaf and hard of hearing communities, to be able to gauge what the needs are for those populations with this type of technology? The answer is yes, and I'm just looking to Katie, our communications director, to see if she has the list. We've planned four of these things uh, in total, and we may do more. We've actually gotten very positive reaction from the first two that we've done, and in fact, people have asked for more. They, they really think that this is the right thing to do, and they want us to do more of them, so we may uh, do more of them. The last one we did, what, what was the? That was with rural and consumer issues. It was just l last week. And we actually had a number of people from the, uh, from the disability community uh, on that one. It is, it, you can be a part of any one that we have, so it's not limited to those. So the other two, what are the two we're left that we have coming up? So we have one um, that is for, uh, go to my, sorry. So we have Kathleen. Yeah. Hi, sorry. <laughs> I was just listening and I didn't know I'd be on mic. Um, so our third one is actually going to be for technology and service providers later this week. Um, but we do have one for policymakers at the end of the month. Um, I believe it's next Wednesday, um, the last week of the month. And that will be a particular interest, I think, to the larger community because we're looking at seeing what kind of policy recommendations um, will help to spur improvement in some of these areas. And so that really is far-reaching. Um, we would like to hear from a variety of groups um, for that. So we do have information available. I can. Happy to yeah, share that. We can after share the that with. Uh, we, we, yeah, sure, yeah. and we actually are um, recording them, audio and written transcript. The written transcript is available a little bit later, but the audio recordings are going to be available on our website, fcc.gov/health. Um, so you can listen to the um, audio from the first one. We'll have the second one on rural and consumer issues probably available later this week. So, so if you think, uh, uh, I'm not suggesting, but if you think that these, this is a valid way to communicate with. Uh, community that you don't you, you might think might not be well enough res represented in, in what we have already done or what we have planned, please let us know. Um, we, we'd certainly be willing to consider, uh, like I said, others have already said we need to do more of these things. So uh, if that's something that may be helpful, please let us know. Last question, Deb. Yes, hi, and thank you so much. My name is Debbie Berlin. I'm representing the National Consumers League, but I also have a project called the Project to Get Older Adults Online. Mm -hmm. So I'm right with you on your thinking, and the questions you've asked us are questions that uh, many uh, organizations have been asking to try and solve some of these issues. And um, I, I wrote down some of your questions. I know Ed did as well. like to think about that, but I'd also like to get a just a better feel, and maybe you can't answer this today, 
of where you're trying to go with the answers to some of these questions? The task force? What, yeah, what are you trying to accomplish? So ultimately, the task force uh, will be learning from all of these mechanisms that, that, that we have uh, mentioned to you today and will be making recommendations to the FCC uh, leadership on these topics. So at least one where area we're going is we hope to get the right recommendations uh, to the to the leadership, so that they can consider and 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 uh, do uh, uh, what they see as as, as right. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much, uh, Julie Carney with the Consumer Technology Association. So, will you be using the um, feedback that you obtained from the public notice that was put out? And Absolutely, that's the whole point Great. of putting it out. That's Wonderful. exactly the point of putting it out. Okay. Thank you. I think a lot of us are anxious to work with the commission and to help further the good work that you're doing now. There's a lot out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. So the next thing that we have on the agenda is consideration of the unwanted call blocking recommendation that the robo group, robocalls working group shared with the full CAC. Um, this went out to everyone probably a week and a half to two weeks ago, uh, just after the Labor Day holiday, and then it was resent as part of the meeting packet. So hopefully everybody has had a chance to take a look and to, to read through it and give some thought to it. Anybody like to move for consideration of the Irene? I'll move for consideration. I'll second. Okay. In favor of consideration? Aye. Opposed? Anyone on the phone? Okay. Discussion. Discussion. Kevin, did you want to maybe walk through it a little bit for everyone as, as a starting point for discussion? Sure. Yep, that'd be great. And for those of you don't, that don't know, this is Kevin Rupi from U.S. Telecom. Um, he co-chairs the Robocall Working Group. So thank you, Ed, uh, and thanks uh, to the Robocall Working Group, which spent a, a very good portion of time uh, working on this. Um, and basically, just to sort of walk through, um, you know, the framework and the recommendations that we put together. I mean, obviously, the introductory section, um, we, you know, highlight the, the work that the FCC is doing on this issue. Uh, and in particular, uh, the blocking MPRM uh, that is currently uh, under consideration, as well as the NOI. And as folks know, within that blocking MPRM, it talks about uh, four specific categories to permit uh, voice providers to block certain categories of call. And those four categories are do not originate, uh, invalid numbers, unallocated numbers, and unassigned numbers. So. Um, basically, working through the, the seven recommendations uh, that we listed out, um, and number one there, uh, we, we ask, we recommend that the FCC uh, permit and encourage voice service providers uh, to block those calls in, in those certain circumstances. Um, and what we did, we, as you start going through the recommendations, we broke out each of the categories. So in that second category, we encouraged the FCC um, 
you know, recommend that the FCC permit and encourage voice service providers to engage in do not originate, which is the DNO. Uh, and then that third recommendation uh, is to permit and encourage voice service providers to block calls under the three remaining instances, okay? So invalid, unallocated, unassigned. Um, and then working through the remainder of the recommendations, um, we basically say for those voice service providers that have implemented any of those uh, call blocking approaches described in either of those two preceding uh, categories, uh, to inform current and potential subscribers about the implementation of those types of blocking. Um, and we added a fifth recommendation that we do think it's important uh, for the FCC to, to recommend uh, to encourage stakeholders from the consumer and industry sectors to work together, to work collaboratively, um, to address the instances whereby un unintended blocking takes place, okay? So this is not going to be, uh, you know, 100% perfect, uh, so we've got to uh, address remediation uh, measures there. Um, the sixth recommendation, um, we do think, uh, we ask for the FCC to encourage voice providers uh, to offer optional blocking tools. So outside of those four categories, um, other types of more consumer-centric, consumer-oriented tools uh, should be made available by voice service providers um, and, you know, make those options easily available so that consumers can find them uh, on the websites <coughs> of the, the voice providers. Um, and then finally, uh, the final category that we put in there, uh, or the final recommendation, <clears throat> was we recommended that the FCC uh, study the implementation and effectiveness of these various blocking measures within two years of you know, finalization uh, of the rules. And, and the recommendation there, uh, we think that, you know, the FCC should take sort of a broad look at this. What's working? What's not working? Uh, what's available to consumers? Are there fees charged, if any? Um, you know, how many consumers are availing themselves of these types of tools? But basically come back after two years to see how it's going and, and see how uh, these robocall mitigation efforts are shaping up. So... That's kind of the overview, and I guess we can take questions or... Yeah, thank you. Any other discussion? Katie, go ahead. Hey, um, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, so in looking at, um, I guess, two and three were the ones that you were talking about, the different types of um, where strange calls may come from. Is there an instance where any of these are legitimate numbers? Like you kind of talked about maybe over accidental blocking. Like I'm not, I don't know if this is even the case, but if you have something like Google Voice, are those assigned numbers, or are there any other kind of call rerouting services that people might actually use for other purposes that could get looped up in this? So that's that's one of the things that's being teed up in the notice. Um, I can give you an example, like on DNO, do not originate. Um, I know as, as industry has been conducting some of these DNO trials, um, one of the approaches we take is that we, we, we will only institute a block, a DNO, on a number that's inbound only, okay? Meaning that that caller ID should never be seen transiting the network. But there have been, there, there was an instance where, you know, we basically had an agency saying, this is an inbound only number. Um, 
but it was, in fact, making outbound calls. So when we instituted that DNO, we were blocking legitimate traffic. Now, the issue got resolved, um, but it's because of that reason that, um, you know, we talk about that recommendation number five, because this is, you know, we're dealing with caller ID, which is easily spoofable. It's it's not an exact mm -hmm. science. So that's why we put in that recommendation number five. Okay. Because, like, I mean, could there be, like, a competition problem there? Like, say you're using something like Google Voice or WhatsApp or anything along those lines that maybe, I guess, reroutes your, your call or something like that that could get, get looped into this is really my... I know... Um, Obviously, that's not the intent of right, the yeah, recommendation, yeah. Uh, and hence why we have that mechanism there so that we're not capturing uh, legitimate calls. And I would add to that that you would also hope those service providers are not sending through any sort of caller ID information that would make their calls that they're passing along seem to be from an unassigned, an unallocated, or an invalid phone number. Um, okay. I think there's a little bit of responsibility on the full ecosystem to make sure that the caller ID information being shared is accurate caller ID information um, so that it doesn't get caught up in something yeah. like this by mistake. Because when I get calls from sometimes those services are like overseas or I don't know, I, sometimes even when friends are in hotel rooms, I'll get like unknown or a number that's not their number or something like that. But and I, I don't think this goes specifically to unknown or to no. blocked caller IDs. This is a specific okay. subset of unallocated, unassigned, or uh, I think junk numbers is a phrase that's okay. sometimes used to describe it. Okay. And that is an issue. Like, there's already work going on in that space in terms of mm -hmm. industry best practices to, to make sure that, you know, we're separating the wheat from the chaff, that, you know, legitimate outbound originators of calls are engaging in, you know, best practices to make sure that, that their calls don't get caught up in this. And is this only referring to voice calls or is this also to like some of those um, like texting services that are? This is so that the FCC's NPRM is focused on voice calls. So voice these calls are, on. okay. These are focused on that. Thank you. Other questions? Ross? Yeah. Just had a question on in terms of the reporting at the end, the expectation of um, voice providers to um, engage in some of these practices that they're encouraged to do so, and perhaps the differences in capability between a larger voice provider and a smaller voice provider and the expectations? Sure. And I, I think that uh, that's an issue that's actually teed up in the NPRM, discussed in the NPRM, and, and I think that is, um, you know, absolutely a valid topic for, for noting and discussing. Um, you know, we've, we've raised that issue in there, and it's important to note that, you know, the, there, are, there are various flavors of blocking. Uh, the four categories that are raised in the FCC's NPRM those are network centric. So those are things that individual providers are doing in the network as a form of network hygiene. And there's going to be different capabilities there, right? But you also have the consumer centric end with, you know, the variety of tools, the growing number of apps and solutions that can, can block calls at that end. Uh, you know, which is touched on in both six and seven. But your point's a fair one, Ross, and it's something that should be fleshed out in, uh, in, the, in the report. And to, to sort of add on to that, I, that's one of the reasons why we landed on permit and encourage right. as, as language. Um, and I think that the, the sentiment behind number seven was to make sure that after we've had some time for these things to be in place, are there consumers who are just completely left out of this from a protection standpoint um, and a nuisance standpoint? Um, so holistically, let's take a look back and see, are there other, is there, an, is there a step two? Um, have things sorted themselves out? What's the landscape look like now? And do we, maybe we don't, maybe we do need to think it through again. Thank you. Any other questions?
Shall we call the question? Question. <laughs> <laughs> Irene so moves. <laughs> Can I get a second? Second. Okay. All in favor of the recommendation? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions in the room or on the phone? See. Katie and Larry. Oh, we have abstentions for Katie the from ATR and Larry from oh. the Got it. Good. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, great. So we'll go to working groups now. Right. Sure. Okay. All right, just a moment here, and I'll call up another file, and we'll talk about working groups this afternoon. All right. Um, well, um, you've heard a lot today, and uh, the idea of this afternoon's working group is so that you can sort of take a start the process of doing a deeper dive on um, some of the issues that we've talked about uh, today. Um, the um, uh, the wor you have in your packet, you have a uh, sheet that provides you with information on the locations of these working groups uh, and also provides you with the uh, call-in numbers or access codes for the various uh, bridges for each group. Uh, just one moment here. I'll go over that briefly. All right, um, the uh, location of the USF digital group, and these are, by the way, private meetings. Uh, they're not broadcast on the internet, um, which is the case for all of our working groups. Um, the USF digital uh, group will remain uh, in the uh, commission meeting room here. And uh, uh, you won't have to do anything to get the bridge up and running. The AV staff will handle that for you, uh, for those wishing to call in. Um, they'll be using the same access numbers, access codes that uh, they used for the plenary sessions. The uh, robocall group will be in room uh, TWC 438, uh, which is right around the corner behind me here up the short flight of stairs to your right, and uh, Catherine or I will be there to let you into those rooms for 68 and 438, which are adjacent to each other. Up the stairs, make a right, and the rooms will be on your right. Uh, 468, again, the, the room right next to 438, uh, will be the slamming cramming group. Um, and finally, the repack group, another new uh, working group, will be across the hall from me right here, uh, right past the intersecting corridor going to the lobby. And on your left is uh, TW-A402. Uh, we'd appreciate someone volunteering to set up the call on the conference terminal, um, either an existing working group chair or a volunteer in the case of uh, the two new working groups so that uh, your fellow uh, members can call in uh, to these sessions. It'll be about 50 minutes. Uh, get back here at around 2.30, and then we'll have a report back uh, uh, from the groups in terms of what you covered and so forth. Now, by the way, uh, in, your, in these group uh, meetings in these rooms, we've uh, placed copies of the uh, the notices that you heard about this morning. So there'll be hard copy, about 10 copies each. If we need more copies, we can make them. Uh, 
um, or, or send them to you electronically also. So uh, you'll have a copy of the slime and cramming item, uh, the rural uh, call completion item, for example, and uh, the rest of the documents in, in the rooms for your review. And Scott, just to clarify, anyone who is currently on the call bridge that wishes to participate in the USF group just needs to stay exactly where they are. They don't that need to is dial correct. back in. If you want right. to go into another group, however, then you're going to have to redial and use one of the, uh, the access code numbers that uh, I provided in the uh, email that I sent to you on Friday. Or you can have a phone on each ear. Right. Right. Uh, any questions? at this point, and uh, uh, Catherine and I will try to direct traffic uh, as we go to our breakout rooms, um, and they're all pretty very close to uh, the commission meeting room where we are now. Anything else, Ed? Nope. See everybody back at 12. All right. Take care. Thanks. along what we've done in the past and then we can sort of just work off of that and until there's an MPRM it's sort of been yeah I feel like that's all I've said this year is like we should do a lifeline recommendation and no I think we're good holding Welcome back to the meeting room, everyone. Okay. Thanks for staying with us through the afternoon. Uh, next up on the agenda, we have report backs from the working group. So hopefully you all took a vote and decided who was going to be speaking and presenting for your report back. Uh, I'm going to turn it over first to the USF group, uh, Amina and Olivia. Great. Uh, this is Amina Fazula with NDIA. Um, our report um, from the USF group, um, mainly on two items. Um, we're going to look into um, uh, the 477 issue around broadband speeds, and, um, and we're going to start to discuss potential recommendations around Lifeline. Okay. Great. Thank you. Steve, do you want to talk about the REPAC group? Yeah, hi, uh, yeah, Steve. Yeah, so um, we just had a, uh, a very brief uh, discussion about uh, what some potential issues that we might discuss uh, from uh, channel reception to uh, uh, working um, on outreach, uh, consumer education, and uh, mer maybe emergency alert, uh, just di different issues such as that. Uh, and so where we're going to go from there is uh, set up a call, maybe two calls, and have a, uh, a couple of uh, speakers, um, one maybe from the FCC and maybe another from another group, just to, to begin uh, giving some background uh, on this issue uh, in terms of uh, those things, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, consumer education and so on. So we can kind of understand uh, where we are, and then from there we'll try to bubble up some ideas and see what help we can give the FCC. That's where we left it. Okay, great. Thank you. Lynn, can I put you on the spot to talk sure. about slamming and cramming? <laughs> so is it the, um, is our first meeting of this? Oh, yes. So you can just slide. It was our first um, meeting of the slamming and cramming working group, and we discussed some of the things that were raised in the notice. Um, we had just a couple of people in attendance, one on the phone, so we are going to schedule a call for the near future to talk about what we could possibly recommend. Um, to the commission while they're uh, debating this proceeding. Great. Thank you. Uh, on the robocalls working group, we talked uh, 
a little bit about the um, caller ID unmasking issue that's been teed up for the commission and it was sort of general consensus that we should probably reach out to some others in this space uh, to get a little bit better understanding of the the full landscape of issues in that arena um, before deciding if it's even something that is appropriate for the CAC and for that working group to weigh in on. Uh, we've also started a brief discussion on caller ID and the, the trust anchor um, and, and shake and stir. There's a little bit of concern that that's much more of a technical conversation than a consumer conversation. Uh, but we plan to explore that a little bit and see if there are consumer angles to work into that um, and, and if there's consumer advice that really fits into that space at this stage. Um, and then the third thing that we've teed up for our next working group call is the idea around reassigned number databases. Um, what does that look like? Um, what, are the, what are the angles and the issues there? And how do we as a working group work together to come up with some thoughtful feedback for the commission on that if it's appropriate. So we'll be scheduling a call soon as well um, to continue that process. And thanks again to, for everyone's support in passing the recommendation that went through today. Very much appreciated. We did, we did have a couple comments from the public today. So all of those people on Twitter who were reaching out to us, we want you to know that we're not ignoring you. We just hadn't gotten to the point yet where we tee up what you shared. Um, so there were a number of different entities and organizations that, dis that sent us the question, will the U.S. follow other nations in using TV white spaces for broadband? So we heard the question. Uh, that will be shared with people here in the building to, to give thought and feedback to. And to the extent that it fits into any of our working groups, we'll have discussions around it. Uh, we also did get a question about battery backups um, and if they are practical in the real world with no visual indications that the battery is okay and do not have automatic switchover in case of power failure. Um, I think a lot of those topics have moved to the BDAC, but to the extent that they fit into any of our working groups, again, that's something we'll take into consideration and We'll share it with people in the building who are, who are looking into that. Uh, and there was a final comment about rates charged for overseas calls and how that fits into the FCC's Title II authority. So as we continue to look through issues, we'll continue to work on that and share that with other people who should be made aware of it. So thank you to everyone who submitted comments, and we appreciate the engagement and participation. Anybody else in the room with comments? Anyone else in the room with comments from the public? Okay. So Scott wanted me to sort of throw out uh, a little bit of a quick conversation around days of the week that we have our meetings. So the easiest days to get scheduled time in this room are typically Mondays or Fridays. The CAC has tended to land on Fridays more often than Mondays, but since today is Monday still, I think, <laughs> um, we wanted to see if anybody had a strong preference for Fridays or Mondays moving forward. Our next, just to put it in context, our next meeting would likely be in January. Yeah. The first Monday in Jan. No. <laughs> <laughs> Probably late to mid to late January. Mid to late, we're going to run into Martin Luther King holiday and so forth. So I would encourage us to try to beat that. Okay. Or skip that. Like, we're like, like it, January yeah. 26. Um, January 26th is a Friday. Yeah, that's one of the dates that we were considering is Friday the 26th. But I think the, the question out there still is, to, is there a strong preference towards Fridays or Mondays? And then we can find a date that works if there is. Seems like. Doesn't matter. No, strong. That hits at a difficult time personally, but 
because of uh, my university schedule, but I'm just one. But that's difficult whether it's a Friday or a Monday, right? That late in the month. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so it sounds like tentatively hold the date for January 26th, and then we will see if we can identify another date that might make sense or, or let you know if that needs to change for any reason. Well, anything else for the good of the order? Anything else for the good of the order? <laughs> All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Yes, I'm in. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions or opposition? Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> stop. Stop. Enjoy the rest of your week, thanks, and thanks, everybody. everybody, for coming out. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you.